that was pretty good welcome everybody to the saturday no sunday what am i thinking of? last week was saturday the sunday live stream and uh, we are drinking malta goya this is uh basically a puerto rican staple uh it's a non-alcoholic malt product i grew up with this occasionally i'll have one just so everybody knows i have my second surgery on the jaw the lower jaw they have to carve out some very porous bone material and to do that i had to give up four teeth on either side yeah collateral damage as they call it later on i'm going to be getting some bone grafts before i get some implants then installed yeah but so far i'm having a little bit of pain 
I took some Tylenol prior to this, and I actually did a one-hour consult earlier this afternoon, and uh, it went well. I didn't suffer too much. Anyway, so we are here to discuss the Pro 1000, I believe, and waiting in the aisles. And as I am looking at the actual thumbnail, I see something extremely exciting, okay? And that's going to be a lot of fun. That is Michael Lee from Precision Colors will be setting up something for us, okay? And a little bit for, a little bit further from now. We'll wait until a few more people join us here. Hopefully, we'll get to about 40. Right now, we have 40, 23 people here. I hope you guys enjoyed the last video that I actually uploaded yesterday. I decided to explain a bit about printer lingo, if you will, certain phrases and terms that we guys in the biz tend to use, and that may confuse some people that are considered more layman or layperson. Uh, they really don't know the terminology. So I went through various terms, about 18 of them, and I gave my best explanation as to what each meant and how it applies to our printers and the processes that we are involved in. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I got some pretty nice comments. Um, the one that I did earlier, I got a really, really nasty response from someone. And basically that was, I was just kind of, it was kind of a tongue in cheek title that your printer, a certain kind of printer, not all of them, may actually last longer if you refill. And what I was getting at was that when you refill and re you replace full sets of cartridges, okay, once you build up those two sets, you will reduce, astronomically reduce the purge cycle or the repriming's of the printhead that occur on printers such as this back here. When you close the lid after replacing one cartridge, it performs a global purge or repriming, whatever you want to call it, it wastes ink. And if you replace only one at a time, you will have a full purge every single time. When you get into that domino effect situation, you'll be doing this quite often. Whereas if you reset and refill a full set of cartridges, it's like starting from fresh. It may have taken you two to three months to get a cartridge to reach low or even empty. So imagine reducing those purge cycles, which means you are going to reduce the amount of waste ink generated that goes into those internal waste pads. Yes, your printer will last longer because it will not go dead on you, okay? Once those pads are full, it goes dead and you have to send it in for replacement and resetting. That's what I meant. Well, anyway, I got, I had to delete the post because she was getting out of hand. But, you know, people just don't quite grasp sometimes what I am trying to explain. And it was just meant as a interesting, um, not theory, but, you know, statement that your printer may last longer if you refill. Imagine, you're not gonna be replacing full sets of OEM inks just because one of them is low, right? You're not gonna do that. So you're gonna let them go empty each and then replace them each at, you know, one at a time as needed. All right, so we have we are up to 28. I think that's plenty of time. So let's bring in our guest, Mike Lee from Precision Colors. He is hiding back here, but I want you guys to take a really good look. I'm gonna solo him. You see that Pro 300? Well, we saw that being installed live, but look what came in the mail. Just yesterday, as a matter of fact, he called me to tell me that he had received that new Pixma Pro 200, and guess what he is going to do for us? He's gonna set it up in front of us. So Mike, go ahead and take over, my friend. Nice to have you back. It's been a while. Hello, boys and girls. <laughs> Well, Jose didn't mention it, but it's Valentine's Day today. Oh, yes. Happy Valentine's. Valentine's. We have one beautiful lady here with us. I know for a fact that is Wendy, my friend Wendy from uh, Belgium, the country that I spent three glorious years at when I was in the military. So happy Valentine's Day to Wendy. All right, go ahead. Hey, Joe, Valentine's can also apply. You know, I understand you're an older guy, but... 
it can apply to males too, you know. We, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be left out of Valentine's. So we can be That's loved right. as well. Come on. Yeah. It's like everybody loves you, right? I, so there you go. I think, I think not that one person, but she was really, really angry with me. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyways, that, that happens. You know, we're all printed nerds here, so yeah, we're spending Valentine's with our printers. Can you believe that? So you know, I never <laughs> thought about that. Oh my goodness, I should really be upstairs cooking well, for my wife. I was asked that question today. Why today? <laughs> yeah, so I kind of the forewarning there to other people who've forgotten today's Valentine's. But anyways. Yeah, so after ordering the Pro 200 late last year in Canada, I think that would have been late October or so or November. I was told that it should arrive in the first week in December. Then before December came along, I was told it was going to arrive on December 24th. So I thought I would have a birth, not a birthday, a Christmas present. Didn't arrive. Then I inquired in January, and then I was told, oh, it should be arriving February 4th. Pretty good situation here, February 4th. So February 4th came along. Nothing shows up. Phone in. Oh, it'll be March the 2nd. After March the 2nd, uh, a few minutes later, I get another email, March the 5th. So I said, you know what? In January, I could have ordered from B and H, but I figured B and H would take about two weeks or so to arrive, and it would only about a, be a difference about a week. So I said, oh, "I'll just leave it, let it sit. I'll accept it for a week later." But when it didn't come, I said, "The heck with that! I'm I'm gonna call in B and H and order one." So I ordered one Monday, and it showed up yesterday. Wow! So That's I'm bad. happy. Yeah, finally, because I've been getting a lot of inquiries about the Pro 200, Pro 200, and though I ordered it way back late last year, I couldn't get one, not for lack of trying. So here we are, the Pro 200 sitting on top, the box of the Pro 300, and that'll tell us something right away, right? The box is the same size. So we're going to expect that's probably going to be the pretty much the same printer. But before we get along to the Pro 200, Pro 300, I told you, you know, I've got in my office here um, a whole generation of 13-inch Canon printers, except for the very first ones. The i9, i960, was it? and the i9100 or 9600, the ones without the chips. I had a 9900 once. It was a nice printer. It had a curved uh, chassis to it. When I got my Pro 9000, I sold it off. But... Um, Do you want to um, shift the camera on to you so we can hear I'm going to take the camera off the tripod. Okay. And I'm going to... And remember, this is all live. And some people may not know what a um, Pro yeah, 9000 so let, let, let me, uh, this printer down here, let me zoom in. Mm -hmm. That's a Pro 9000. Now, in the 13-inch printer, when Canon went to chips after the i9900, they then introduced a die and a sister or brother printer called pigment printer. So starting in this generation here, the Pro 9000, it had a brother printer, the 9500, which was pigment. So this one is pigment, and this one is die. This ushered in the first use of chips on the cartridges. And this would go back, I think the Pro 9000 was about, what, 2005, so, Joe? I, I never did get a original 9000. I got the 
Mark, Mark II. Yeah. And I yeah. bought I bought that used on eBay. And well, you know, it worked perfectly. So well, both these printers are used as well. I bought these used. This one was purchased from someone who had it stored in the basement for about a couple of years. And this one I purchased, I think, in 2015. I had one before, and I sold it off, and I bought my Pro 10 for lack of space. But then I realized ah, I shouldn't have sold it off because I wanted to then develop the replacement for the image specialist ink set for mm -hmm. the 9500, which got rid of a lot of the issues the OEM 9500 had with um, gloss differential. And yeah, people are curious where most sellers get their inks from. And you just mentioned image specialists. Could you give us a, a little quick uh, description? Who, who are these folks? And oh, what, well, image what, have, what have they been involved in the last 10, 15 years? Image specialists, um, they're essentially no more. And that's the evolution of the industry. Uh, they started out as being one of the more popular or better inks you can get that was made in the USA in the late 90s, mm -hmm. early 2000s. That was when inkjet printers were blossoming and everybody was getting an inkjet printer. Um, there was a chemist there by the name of Walter. He did a lot of work in developing the inks. And the, the story I got was they never really intended to make inks for the 9500. But somebody from Canada actually asked them about it and they did some work on it. Mm -hmm. But in any case... Um, Image specialists over time had stuck with the desktop market. And as the desktop market shrunk, their volume shrunk. So um, at about 2009, 2010 or so, they were sold or something to STS Inks in Florida. Mm -hmm. So STS Inks now makes the image specialist formulas. Right. And both of these companies are based in the United States. Yeah, they're based and in the basically United every reseller out there that was selling inks for most of the printers that were refillable were basically buying the same inks from that same provider, right? I don't know if there were no, there were other inkjet labs as well in the States. Are they are there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There okay. were lots. So I, I I don't think that's a fair statement. But, so for but, but many but, were many were uh, MIS yeah. associates at one point in time. Yeah, MIS okay was a major uh, customer of image specialists. But um, one big thing happened is that unfortunately, sadly, I think uh, on N New Year's Eve. In 2010 or so, Walter, the, the, the chemist or the guy who made the ink from it, especially passed away. Ah, uh, very sadly. He actually, when I when I when I was a customer of theirs, and I still am to a certain degree, um, I spoke to him. He he actually explained a lot of ink terminology and stuff to me. Mm -hmm. So he was quite knowledgeable. And some of the inks he did produce are still not even, not, it's still top notch, some mm -hmm. of the work he did. But again, he was working with some limited pigments at the time. So he, he only could do what he had available to him. So over time, better pigments were made and, and um, improvements have been made. So, but image specialists is, um, they retained some formulas by STS, um, but they're not a, they're, they, since the CLIA days, they did not really develop any new ink sets, mm -hmm. uh, possibly due to the passing of Walter. Okay. But um, let's, let's continue this. So we've got the Pro 9000, 9500, which ushered in the first pigment ink printers for Canon. 
And the 9500 was delayed by over a year, if I remember, because uh, they had announced it and said they would have it on the market, but they kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and the delay was over a year. And it looks like the delay was because of the unique cartridge design they had to develop. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that was, that's the, the 9,9500. And that continued to what? Um, the Pro 100 was then ushered in. Let me show you the Pro 100 here. That Which was introduced what 2000? That one there mm -hmm. that replaced the Pro 9000 Mark II. I think that was brought in what 2008, no 2009 or so. Yeah, it's quite old. Yeah, it's quite old. It's uh, but um, it's one of those old goodies. I, I, I don't think they expected it to become probably the most popular printer in the world. Well. As far as sales go, and, and because of the offers that they were giving. Oh, out. I heard a little interesting story. I don't know how much truth there is to it, but apparently, um, Canon head honcho had be uh, there was a new head honcho, mm -hmm. and Canon, when he took over, um, Canon was basically the leader in cameras and imaging. Mm -hmm. And he asked the question because at the same time, Epson was advertising in all the boxes, the printers preferred or used by the most photographers in the world or something to that effect. So the question the head honcho at Canon asked was if we're the leaders in, in cameras and imaging, and we have printers, how come nobody knows about our printers? And that was an interesting question, I thought. Because back then, Canon, as you know, Joe, was uh, a very small player in, when it came to photo printers. Everybody knew Epson, 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 and HP. Yeah. Epson and HP, right? And some of the... Canon was was popular a little bit with your desktop machines because the mom and pops love the easy to refill. But when it came to photo printers, um, the photographers didn't quite catch on to the Canon fo photo printers. So he raised that question both on the desktop and in a white format. And that certainly, you know, shook things up a little bit at Canon as to why they couldn't be that. So apparently it looks like the timing of when he took over, it was towards the end of the Pro 9000. And we got the Pro 100 in about 20, 2010, I think, mm -hmm. or 2009, somewhere there. But the key thing to understand is the Pro, 9, the Pro 100 was being developed right after or during the great financial crisis. Do you remember that? Yep. When the world financial system nearly came to a crawl and it, it was, it was seriously bad. Don't for the younger people who don't know that time and who don't realize it, um, who didn't keep up with what was going on, the world really had come to a crisis, a serious crisis where, even serious bankers were concerned about food getting to supermarkets. It was worse than the, essentially, potentially worse than the COVID crisis we had last year. Mm -hmm. Right? But that was averted. And many people don't understand that, you know, we, we were very fortunate to have missed that potential Great Depression out of debt. But anyways, I won't get into financial discussions too much. But this thing being born, the Pro 100, out of the, 
after the great financial crisis, what you saw was it appears that Canada did not want to spend a lot of money in tooling. And that was a very fortunate thing for us refillers. Very, very fortunate because, because of that, they continued to use the cartridge bodies and molds from this little puppy here, the Pro 9000, the CLI-8 with the clear bodies. And when the Pro 100 came out here, it had the clear body, but there was speculation, and I speculated that resetters would be no more. Mike, let me show everybody the two printers, two print cartridges, CLI-8 here, CLI-42 here. Absolutely identical. Okay. Yeah. The difference being the chip. Right. So these cartridges, both of them were produced from the original molds for the 9000 and possibly others, right? Other, There were other models that were using the uh, CLI-8, right? Other models of printers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is very different for Canon, actually, uh, versus Epson. When mm -hmm. Epson brings out a new printer, typically they, they bring out a new cartridge and chip every for every two, three models they do that. But Canon seems to have kept their common sense, and, and when they made a model of a cartridge, they would try to use it amongst different printers. So, you know, from a consumer standpoint, from a retailer standpoint, that's great because with the limited shelf space, they could service a lot of models. So after the Pro 100 came out, we then saw, I can't remember if it came out, if the Pro 1, which is that printer there behind us on top. That is a 13 inch Canon printer, the Pro 1. And that uses completely different cartridges and completely different ink fee technology. So after the Pro 1 came out, we then write completely different. So after the Pro 1 came out, that was intended to be a high-end, but 13-inch printer. It was heavy. It was huge. 70 pounds. Yeah. Well, you know that from recent carrying it yeah. recently. And um, it was expensive. So I don't think that did very well in the market because 13 inches, it was competing against the R. 3000 and the R2880. Remember that? The R2880? Yeah. Which was considerably less money, I think. So that didn't hit any good. Those were Epson, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the Pro 1 didn't really get a very good reception in the marketplace. And uh, looking back at it, we know why. But after the Pro 1 was introduced, later on, we saw the brother to the Pro 100, which is the Pro 10. See, look, that's the Pro 100 underneath and the Pro 10 on top. It used the same, basically, molds, same body size, same box, different color. A little slight different color in different places on the printer. But I would say 80 to 90% of the parts are the same, except the main board, the print head, and the, even the print head carriage shared a lot of parts. Mm -hmm. Right? So it was just um, some. Many people ask me, can I put pigment ink into my Pro 100 to get better longevity? And if that was possible, Canon wouldn't have bought it to make a new printer. And it's right. required tooling. So that kind of answers the question. There's a reason why they make a Pro 100 and a Pro 10. And by the way, many, many people, when they want to buy ink for a Pro 10, they go buy the Pro 100 and then they find out, how come it doesn't have 10 bottles? And then they realize, I bought the wrong right. refill kit. Yep. 
right? Those zeros, well, actually, zeros don't mean much, but in this case, it does mean a lot. So, anyways, the, the, there you are, the Pro 10 and the, on top and the Pro 100 below. So, we have a basically, we got three generations here in this room. We've got the 9,000, 9,500, moving on to the 100 Pro 10 pigment. And here in those two boxes now, the latest, the Pro 300, which is the pigment, and the Pro 200, which is the dye to replace the Pro 100. So without further ado, let's uh, start taking, let's see what comes in the box. Uh, remember folks, this is live, nothing rehearsed, nothing edited. If you're boo-boos, you know why. Are you gonna set it up on that table that you have cleared out? Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. You can talk about other things while I'm doing this. The, um, if you wish. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on you. The printers that he basically was speaking of as they kept being developed, um, I think improvements were made. If I remember correctly, the output on the 9500 is nowhere as good as the Pro 10 output turned out to be in. Both printers did have a 10 color palette, but the Pro 10 then utilized Chroma Optimizer. I think it was the first time they attempted to do that. And so then they also introduced that on the Pro 1, which is 12 cartridges, these big boys right here. About, I would say, I think it was almost 40 ml of ink per cartridge or maybe maybe less I, I don't quite remember but anyway that was quite a change in their normal printer design that pro one turned out to be a monster and i will share once once mike is done and he is gone and having dinner i will explain to you what i just experienced with a pro one okay quite interesting and maybe the person who is, was involved, maybe he is here tonight and we'll be discussing what happened. And um, But anyway, 12 cartridges, they sit six and six on those two panels that you see laterally located on the printer. The problem with that printer was that, boy, if you complain about the Pro 1000 wasting ink, you have no idea what you're talking about. That Pro 1 would go through these cartridges like it was no tomorrow. Okay? Hey, Joe, and, do mention that on the Pro 1, it's a pressurized cartridge. Right. These cartridges have an ink splatter internally. And I have one that I dissected the side off of it. You can see that aluminized bag. Then the compartment is covered with this sealing um, layer of mylar. And the internal compartment, then it is pressurized. And so that bag, which then has the ink in it, can feed or generate the correct pressure to feed ink into the system. And again, you have ink lines leading to the printhead. And I think if Mike, Mike was telling me on our earlier phone call this past week that that was Cannon's first attempt at pressurizing. Correct. 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 So that was the point. that only white formats retain the same design philosophy as the current 1000, 2000. So that they made a departure. And when they made that departure, they made an announcement that it was going to be likely uh, the first of many printers using that design. But and that's like that, that did not work out, did it? It didn't work out. They backed off. So Pro 1000 comes out all of a sudden. Pro 1 is out of commission. It's no longer being produced. All of a sudden, we have a printer that is no longer pressurized. This is literally just a container. It has nothing internally. I've opened one, cracked it open. It's just a, a cup 
if you will, and it is slanted downhill. If you see the bottom, this is slanted downward, and it leads directly to the exit port, which then enters into the pickup stamp of the ink delivery system, and I guess just feeds ink without having to pressurize the tank. Now, apparently, and Mike can jump in anytime he wants, apparently the system that enters, the, the stem that enters the cartridge can also perform venting. In other words, to relieve the vacuum that would be generated as ink is leaving, air has to enter. So it produces a dual type function process. It allows ink to exit and allows air to come in and relieve that vacuum. So now we're watching Mike as he is setting up the printer. He's dismantling all of the internal. How, mu how much tape do you have there, Mike? A lot of orange well, tape? Yeah, lots of orange tape. Similar Did it have a uh, phone rubber uh, yep. block to keep the printhead assembly from moving? Yeah, that's Swapping around? Doing. Yeah. Taking it all apart. Are you seeing it? Really yeah, like, and folks, this is this is the mundane aspects of uh, very mundane setting yeah. setting up a printer. We all have to do that. There are some differences to the Pro Ten immediately that I noticed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show it to you eventually. And, uh, folks, make sure when you set up your printer, you search high and low for every possible little bit of tape. Because once things start moving around, you don't want to have a jam just because you forgot one piece of tape somewhere. I got a friend who refuses to take the little protective plastic off of the, any kind of screen. <laughs> well, Everything cleared off? I think so, but let me... Um, Do you want to rotate it so that it's facing us? Yeah. The table? That way we can see, that. see what the fuck baby looks like. Oh, my. Okay, and no. so, unlike the Pro 100, this has a nice LCD screen or LED screen. We'll, we'll get to that later on. I, yeah, so I think that's, I'll, I'll go to the so details, that's, but let me, let me show you something. Okay. That's one thing that I immediately noticed. Okay. What you will notice, you see the texture on the top lid? Okay. Yeah. You see the striations? Yeah. Like, like it's, a, it's like a brushed aluminum. Yeah. Give you that kind of a metallic look. That's nice. All right. Now, the Pro 300... Does not have any of that. That's okay. Pro 300. Hmm. Pro 300 surface texture would resemble and feel just like the Pro 1000 surface texture. So Canon went to the trouble to make new molds hmm. in this top area here. It'll be feel. Yeah. So what's unique about the Pro 100 over the Pro 10 externally? Pros, okay. This lid, the surface texture mm -hmm. is different. It's got a brushed aluminum, a, a fairly significant brush texture mm -hmm. and, and with lines. Uh, the top panel, same thing. Other than that, um, it looks to be identical. Okay, so what they did was they kept the Pro 300 to look and feel more like the Pro 1000 and maintain the image ProGraph name on it. So a little bit of small detail marking. The other thing too, Pro 200 has a, a Pixma on it. See that Pixma? Yeah. The Pro 300, they don't put any Pixma um, markings on it. And on the Pro 300, they have the image ProGraph. See that on the corner yeah. there? All right? Yeah. 
They don't have that on the Pro 200, but they put a Pixma on it, denoting that it belongs to a different category of printer. So they have basically orphaned the Pro 10, in other words, whereas the um, Pro 200 is really the uh, big sister of the Pro 100. Yeah. Pro 10 now wants to be the uh, baby sister of the Pro 1000. Yeah, the, the Pro 10 has been... I mean, like, the Pro 300, what am I the saying? The Pro yeah. 300 now, Canon wants to distinctly put it together with the Pro 1000 category of printers. And the Pixma wants to be retained within the desktop, like this one here. Mm -hmm. Line where it's got Pixma on it. Yeah. So it, 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 they've, they've done that. They want to do some market differentiation between the two. So let me put this thing back. I think you can clearly see the, the brushed look on it with the light. Right. Let me uh, let me quickly address the viewers. Those who are watching, um, feel free to post anything you want to ask later on the second half, and I will go ahead and uh, start from the beginning. Say hello to everybody. I don't want to interrupt the process at this point by posting your comments yet, but don't worry. I will be here afterwards, and we will address everybody and any questions they may have had. Okay. One of the big questions people have been asking is, is the printhead the same as the Pro 100? Let me go downstairs. I have a spare Pro 100 printhead. And I will go away for three minutes, Joe. Okay. And I'll come back with a printhead so I can compare the two. And we'll know what the situation is, okay? All right, no problem. All right, so printheads. If you guys recall what Epson had been doing now for quite a number of years, coming up with a new printhead is a very expensive proposition. It has to be redesigned. There's a lot of printhead improvements, especially in the early days. Printheads by themselves were very prone to clogs. They have come up with all kinds of improvements in the actual meniscus that is formed at the opening of each nozzle which then retains that little area wet. It does not dry. Uh, Teflon coated uh, nozzle plates were created, but here's the catch. All of the ultra chrome K3, K3 meaning three blacks systems on Epson printers had eight channel print hits in nine colors of ink. So you had to share that black channel with two blacks. Well, for years and years and years, they decided not to redesign a printhead, even though they had already larger capacity printheads for other models like the 4900, okay, and other, other nice big floor units. They kind of refused to make that advance because, of course, it requires total redesign, come up with a new printhead, say, that didn't have the same number of channels of an existing Printhead. They didn't want to use a 12 channel printhead or 11 channel printhead because you would need a much larger chassis to be able to access the size of that printhead traveling back and forth and still give full clearance to the right, full clearance to the left. If that printhead is six inches wide, you need 12 inch extra inches of space internally to be able to use it. So they were very. Um, What's the word? Stubborn? No, I don't want to use that word, but you know what I mean. In delaying the development of a printhead that was suitable for that new family that is coming out now, the P900, P700. 10 channels, finally. 10 channels, 10 inks. No need to share black channels anymore. And when you do that, you no longer need that black ink switch valve any longer. So that's, that's a development that they have just finally introduced on Epson printers. And it took a long time, but it's a very welcome improvement. I think Mike is back. Yeah, so I'm back. The Pro 100 printhead is a... Let me let me huge. put you on full screen here. Hang on. All right, go. I don't think you'll be able to see it on this camera because it's very, very faint. But you may want to note this down. It's a QI6-00... Eight four. 
Made in Japan. That's the program. Okay, so that, the that's the code catalog number or whatever. 0084, right. Mm -hmm. Pro 200 printed. Let me open the bag. And I want to remind people, we're not doing printer reviews. We're going through a printer from a refiller standpoint. Right. So what we need to know. Undoubtedly, the print quality will be excellent. I think we all can agree that that, that, that goes without saying at this point in time. So, what do I see? QI60084, made in Japan. Identical printhead, folks. So, that is the same printhead? Same printhead as a Pro 100. Okay. Okay. So, right okay, there. that's a good thing to know because... Pro 100 being out of commission now, and if you need to print it for it. Yeah, so the Pro 100s can be in service for a long time again, because if the Pro 200, let's assume it's going to be around for another eight years, that means Pro 100 printheads can be purchased for another eight years. Mm hmm so that would have given it a service life of 16 years for potentially a service of 16 years. Right. Before you can't get printheads, which is quite long, very long. Yeah. Okay. So we know it's the same printhead. Let's go to the cartridges now. And here's the cartridge pack. I am going to open it. You know, at this point, there was really no need to redevelop the printhead because there was nothing wrong with the there was nothing really wrong with the original Pro 100 printhead. It performed beautifully. Okay, look at this. Maybe you want to keep this card. Oh, look, look at those. Look, yeah. Look how pretty that is. Very. Now we can immediately see that the cartridges are indeed opaque, right, Mike? Well, they're white at the bottom, aren't they? Yeah. How about yeah, that? Let's let's open it up. We'll open it up and we'll see what's, what's going on. So let me. What I did was I brought a a brand new CLI eight. Mm hmm Tank. And um What I want to know is whether or not they weigh the same. I mean, there could be some discrepancies in the weight of the opaque plastic. CLI 8, brand new, 28.9 grams. And that, that basically is going to equate to a CLI 42. Right, identical. 29.1, give or take. So I have started a spreadsheet because what I'm going to do is I'm going to note the initial weight. And um, also determine how much is used in setup. So the yellow was 28.9, no, 29.1, sorry. So I'm going to do the slow and boring task of weighing each one of these. Joe, you, you can proceed if you want on other things while I do the mundane task. All right. So, yeah, he is going to determine what the original factory weights are. And when I was doing that, with a couple of the printers that I recently set up, I noticed there was a slight difference in weight 
maybe a, a tenth of a gram difference here and there. And so I don't know what to attribute that to. I assume that these cartridges are filled by machines, and you would assume that would be extremely accurate. I also believe there may be some discrepancies, especially on a cartridge with a sponge. Do the sponge, are the sponges exactly the same way? Even though they are exactly the same dimensions? Maybe yes, maybe no. There's many factors that would contribute to a slight change, maybe a tenth of a gram difference in weight. But we want to determine what happens after the initial ink charge of the printhead. Remember, these cartridges sit on the printhead. There are no ink lines. They're just going to directly prime the printhead. I'm sure there is also some waste of ink because the printhead has to be uh, primed to the point where it is actually expelling some ink from the nozzle plate. And then Mike is going to then reweigh the cartridges, right? Yep. And they're going to determine we, how much our... ink it took. And that's going to be a little bit wasteful because then he'll have to replace them back into the printer and he will then run another purge cycle. So that will show us, you know, the actual amount of ink. I know people want to know this exact data. Everybody is dying to know, well, how much ink does this process use, that process use, and so forth. And it makes me think of the Pro 1000 when people are talking about, well, how much ink am I actually wasting on a cleaning cycle? One way to, to know for sure is before you start a print job and you know, you know pretty much it's going to generate a clean cycle before you start printing because it's been a while since you print. Take out the so-called maintenance cartridge and weigh it. Where's my maintenance cartridge? Take this puppy out. Weigh it. This is brand spanking new. So it will weigh a certain amount. The one that is partially used, like this one, actually this one is completely used, will be much heavier because it is going to be filled with white ink. It's not flopping around inside because there's an absorbent pad internally. But what you can do is pre-weigh the cartridge. It weighs 280 grams. And then after the cleaning cycle, the job starts you know, being printed, it is done. Take your print, put it aside, open the back, remove the cartridge again, and weigh it again. That will give you the difference pre and post. You'll know exactly, exactly how many grams of ink were actually wasted. And that may actually scare you, shock you, or you may have a pleasant surprise that it really isn't as bad as you thought, okay? It may not be a ton of ink being wasted. So I know it sounds like it's just throwing away. Dollars are just flying out the window, but maybe not, maybe not. And I have yet to do that. I talk a lot about that stuff, but I really have to go ahead and test that to see what it actually does. What is the difference between before and after? You can do that pretty much with any kind of system. Uh, you can do that with these rather easily. Take one out, weigh it, do a print job, take it out again, weigh it again. You'll know how much, what is this, matte black was actually used, you see. And that that will work really well because in the Pro 1000, you don't have those purge cycles. You can take out a cartridge, look at it, weigh it, put it back in, print a job, come back, take it out again, or take the, every one of them one at a time and weigh them, and you will get a perfect report of how much ink was used not only for any possible pre-print purge cycles or cleaning cycles, but the total usage of ink will be reported by simply weighing each card. I know it's a pain in the neck, but that will give you the actual amount of ink that was used for both sides of the picture, the waste part and the actual laying ink on paper. You can use the accounting manager. I don't know how accurate that really is. It's going to rely on what the printer thinks went through the printhead, okay? It's supposed to be relatively accurate, but I don't know. I don't know. I'd rather just weigh the cartridges and weigh my maintenance cartridge. That will not lie. That will actually be as accurate as you can get. How you doing? Joe, actually, for the Pro 100, it, uh, a priming takes about 0.4 ml per tank, which is about the same as the Epson 15,000. Mm-hmm. Did you um, 
put the printhead in it yet? No. No, I'm waiting for it to stabilize first. I just okay. So you're powering it on. Yeah. It'll come to a point where it tells me uh, that it's missing a printhead. While it's doing that, I'm going to weigh the cartridges after I remove the the vent seals and the mm -hmm. and the the bottom stoppers, but. Just to let people know, I had five of them weigh 29.1 with the stoppers and vent seals, and two of them weigh 29.2, and one of them weigh 29.3. See what so, I mean? Yeah. So there, there, there's always a slight variation, folks. It's it, yeah. It's plus or minus something. But it's difficult to attribute that to different levels of ink at the factory or, you know, differences in the actual weight of the, say, the empty cartridge itself. They may vary in weight by a hundredth of a gram or a tenth of a gram or whatever. It's just actually, you know, the truth is it's just too much info, If you know, too much info. I really am not too concerned about that. Um, especially since we are refillers, we don't worry too much about ink. So it's going to take a few minutes, of course, for the printer to go through its booting up process, initial boot up. I'm sure it is actually checking many of the internal electronics to make sure everything is working properly. And at some point, you're going to get an indication to uh, install the printhead. By the way, there must be a battery inside this printer. The real time clock is right on. Okay. There's a date and time on it. So there's got to be some form of a battery. Okay, so he just uh, opened up the clamp. Yeah, do you see how that's done? Right. Let me, uh, let me yeah, keep it in that orientation, please. There's a little lid. But that is the locking clamp for the printer, which simply just slides into place. All right. That's the protector. The protector. The... Notice on, on the printhead, this outside mold is the same as the Pro 10. Right. But they put a couple of single space here to take up they the just, space. They just block. Yeah, they block the last two slots. Making it into an eight channel printhead all of a sudden. Right. So he just inserted it. It just it just goes right in, right? Yep. And okay, and you clamp it down. Clamp if you down. cannot clamp it down, that means you have it oriented the wrong way or possibly not lined up. So make sure you have that properly lined up. It's hard to make a mistake there. Okay. Let me can you zoom in a little bit? You you're you're right on center, so it should be okay. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Now let me start weighing these suckers. Now, folks, remember, 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 always remove the tab from the vent. Not, not doing so will actually give you a bit of ink flow initially, but at some point it will just simply stop flowing. Now, you said that these cartridges do not have the red light, right? Ooh. Yes, let me go over the cartridge with you. Just hang on. That might shock yeah. a few people who is, expect to see that red light. Okay, there's a story behind this. So these, let me see now. Okay, we're in focus here, right? Yep. Yep. These are the black buddies. Uh, let me get a CLI 42, which is open. Let's compare them, right? Even better, I got a yellow. So it's yellow and yellow, Pro 200, Pro 100. 
opaque, clear. Same dimensions. I see something immediately. Right. Is it an Easter egg? It's not Easter yet. So what do we got here? Uh, focus, focus. You let it go into focus. All right, now it's okay. Uh, there you go. Yeah, just don't move. <laughs> Prism, no prism. All right? Yep. Now, before everybody gets all excited, 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 where is the prism from Canon? Where is the prism from Canon? How come they, they removed the prism? Well, folks, many people and the refilling forums talk about the prism, but they haven't been paying attention. Because the prism from the PGI, the CLI 271, which is two generations back on the desktop, disappeared. So where were those folks who talk about the prism and making all sorts of excitement about it? Where were they? asleep because it was gone two generations ago on the desktops all right I'll, I'll go through a reason why now mike you know, you, do you want to explain please explain a little bit about what the functionality of the prism and cli 8s and cli 42s was um joe so i think i think that better be done on another day. Okay, because all right. There's a story on that and what it does. It's going to take a while. It's going to take some explanation of why it was done. You could just say that it helped to determine when ink was depleted from the liquid chamber. It helped. And just leave it at that. More, it helped more accurately determine right, right. when the cartridge was empty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it helped more accurately, and there's a reason for that. Yeah. The reason for that is the same reason why when Germany sent the the what the V1 of V1 bombers, the bombs, the flying bombs to London, why didn't why most the, of them didn't yeah, the rocket. The right yeah, those missile rockets, yeah. Those missile rockets, right? Very inaccurate. Very inaccurate. Why were they inaccurate? Because they would point it to where they think it should go, make all the adjustments, set it up right, and set it off. But right after it left, it had no way of correcting itself. None. Right, yeah. So if anything led it astray, by the time it got to the end, it would be amplified, the errors would be amplified, and it would not land anywhere close to where they wanted it to land, right? Yeah. So that's the same reason why we have the prism. The prism allows a correction towards the end so that it can land more closely to the target. Correct. So, right? So... So that's the reason why you now over time it, it, it was a mechanical process to determine exactly when it was closer to empty. But the Pro 10 operated without a prism because it was physically impossible to put a prism in a Pro 10 cartridge because of the accordion. Right, right? it had an opaque ink bag. Nope, nope. There's an accordion that goes back and forth. Okay, but you still have a bladder. Ooh, I don't like this. 
I just got a photo sign cartridge I don't like the look of. If you look at it here. What's the problem? See that? On the port? Yep. Let me see what the issue is. That's what a normal port would look like. You see it? Well, okay. Show me the other one. Put it next to it. Okay. Maybe, now, maybe it's just not saturated there yet. Well, let me see what's going on. Again, that shows you, even directly from Canon, sometimes not everything goes as planned by Canon. Yeah. So when something, sometimes something happens, things happen. Oh, I don't like, I don't like the look of this. Wow. It's passing in properly, but it seems for some reason it seems to have dried out a, a little yeah, ring of concentrated ink. Right, doesn't have the same saturation level the others do. Hmm. Yeah, so when you do refilling, sometimes not everything comes out working perfectly the first time. And even if you were to buy OEM tanks, sometimes not everything is perfect when you just get it. The same thing happens with the black. Okay, let me go in. Pull it toward you a little bit. Does that, does that show the same um, problem? Maybe that will, maybe that'll fix itself once it starts to um, prime. It's, it's the same little it, it looks like a. It looks like it was pre. Uh, this one's twenty seven point three black. Okay, I got one more to go again, light gray. All righty. Nope, photo magenta. Photo magenta. Sorry. This is going to be the moment of truth, of course. Oh, oops. Oh, oh. It, it, um, that's okay. It'll you just did. tell me that it's missing a cartridge, it'll come back to it. Yeah. It won't prime. That happens um, when people attempt to refill all the cartridges at once and they have not grasped the process yet and they take too long. Printed has a given amount of time. It'll sit there waiting for you. And some printers don't have that timer. Some, some do, some do not. Uh, he'll just let it sit there bring it back up, it'll move to the center again, and then proceed with the installation of the last one. When you're demonstrating and you're talking and you know spending more time than normal, that will come back to get you. You think it's priming right now? No, nope, it won't because it's missing a cartridge. It knows better. Yeah, it should, it should position itself back to the center. There, there you go. go. So no, no, no panic. Nothing to panic problem. about. No panicking. If it doesn't detect a chip, it, it means it doesn't see a cartridge, mm -hmm. and it won't do any cleaning or any priming because it'll... But that's, that's a lesson for those who, say, do not have a second set of cartridges on a Pro 100 that you can just quickly replace... If you take too long, it's going to do that. It's going to move to the right. Somebody told me, well, why don't you just pull the plug? Well, because then you'll run an even larger cleaning cycle when you repower well, up. 
and you don't want to waste ink unnecessarily. It, it, even if it goes back in, it's going to do nothing when it settles. You want to, you want to zoom back out a little bit, Mike, so we can uh, see the whole printer again. There you go, like that. That's enough. That's good. So you getting any indication on the uh, screen? Yeah. You can see the uh, initial adjustments. Do not turn right, you, off power. Right. Which means the most critical thing, the print hit was recognized. But one minute. Okay, let me let's go back to the LEDs. Okay. Um by not having an LED on the tanks, what happens is Canon is able to save some money on the chips. That's one component they don't have to put on the chip. Oh, you might want to explain where the LEDs exist. The LEDs actually sit on a chip behind the chip here the tiny tiny little yeah, they're they're not located the yeah they're not part of the cartridge no they're, they're part the of the chip okay once you're doing alignment we'll do the alignment one good thing about having a printer with a screen on it Unlike a Pro 100 that you actually have to install onto your computer to be able to perform all of these, the head alignment, the nozzle check, and actual other operations that may require printing. Once you have a screen, you can do that directly from the screen. The computer is not even connected to the printer yet. So it allows you to do all of these pre-operations before you actually install the driver and connect to your computer. So, getting back to the LEDs, um, Canon's removal of the LEDs was quite gradual. Um, when we go back to the desktop machines on the side here and on the top, what you find on the 250, 251, 270, 271, and then the latest on the like 80, 320 to 280, 281. The 250, 251, the 270, 271, and 280, 281 use all identical bodies, outlines. And the 250, 251, which originated about eight years ago, Canon still had the prism. Those printers were replaced by the 270, 271s, where Canon removed the prisms. And on the latest 280, 281, they've also removed them as well. Yeah, that's looking good. Does it? Does your head alignment? No, it's, it's performing alignment. Please wait momentarily about four minutes. So we'll, we'll wait for that to continue. So now what, um, how do you know when you open up your lid? In the Pro 100, the Pro 10, you get a, a blinking light indication, which means you're low on ink or reach or about to reach low. And then the other indication is you're empty. This has no such indication, right? Well, I would suspect that they would probably have a... A yellow because it's, it's going to be yellow. shown on the screen, yeah. Just very similar to the Pro 1000. Mm -hmm. And on, on the desktop machines, they do that. All the Canon machines with the with the displays in the front, they all have that. Um, right. So anyways, Canon is fine-tuning that. They've been fine-tuning the and getting back performance data over years. And they probably have figured out that 
depending on how they do their priming cycles, how fast they do it, and how often they do it, etc., they're able to better estimate what the ink level should be. <clears throat> and at some point, they probably have enough confidence they can eliminate the the LED, the um, the prism. How many sheets does it, does it take? Three or two? Two. Two? Same um, requests and questions. Agree to everything, of course. Just like on the web. No, I don't want to take part in the survey. You know what? I was thinking there's probably going to have... Um, maybe not. On the XP 15,000 from Epson, it did have a little hidden um, firmware activation mode that I quickly had to disable. So okay, that I yep, yep. It keeps asking you about that. Yeah. My XP 15,000, it uh, keeps asking you. Yeah, you can update. disable that. Okay, let me uh, install the driver. This is boring part. No other problem. Most of this stuff that we do is quite mundane and boring. Um, but the results are always, of course, the end when we get beautiful prints. While you are talking or now installing the driver, and that's a pretty simple process, folks. You know, download the driver. If you're a Mac user, make sure you download the actual driver from Canon or Epson, okay? Go to their support page, and it will recognize that you are running OS whatever, and it will then show you the correct driver to download for that particular printer model. Don't simply plug in your printer and let the magic occur. It will very likely install the Air driver, which is just a generic driver without any other functionality the actual driver will have. Okay. About two weeks ago, I got an email from a gentleman who had a Pro 1 that was showing a B200 error. And that means that you get a flashing light, 10 of them, 10 on, off, on, off, on, off, like that, 10 blinking lights. And then it pauses, and then it repeats that process. And that usually means you need a, pre, a new printhead. But on the Pro 1, it's not as easy as you might think. It's not as simply as simple as just opening the lid like on the Pro 200 and let that printhead go to the mid, you know, the middle. You remove your cartridges, unclamp it, remove it, put a new one in, and repeat the process. No, you have to go through a certain process that starts with the printer being off. Okay. It's like getting it almost into some sort of service mode condition. Well, I send him the instructions. Nothing worked. He could not get that printhead to move to the center. I don't know whether he had a printhead already on hand or not. Well, after back and forth and many, many different attempts, it did not work. So he offered to send it to me. And I thought, I already have a Pro 1. I've gone through two printheads already. I'm on the third printhead, the original printhead. And Mike can vouch to this when we were both installing our Pro 1s from the beginning. From the beginning, they threw a B200 error. I had to call Canon. They gave me the runaround. Oh, you know, you're not under warranty, blah, 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 blah. I kept fiddling, fiddling with it. Finally, it began to prime the printhead. So I crossed my fingers, and I got to printing. I did a bunch of videos, blah, 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 blah. And about six months later, B200 error I could not solve by doing the trick of unplugging the printer, plugging it back on. Put a new printhead on it, perfect. Spend $155 for that printhead, which is not bad considering. Now, a year or so later, again, another B200 error that I could not solve doing that trick. And lately, this is now on the third printhead, so the original one, the second one, and a third one, and I got a fourth one waiting just in case knock on wood. If I don't print on that printer for more than a month, it will throw a B200 error. Okay? 
and I can solve it by unplugging it, put it back in. It will waste a ton of ink and it'll be fine again. So now I am printing with QImage, the unclog tool every 24 hours, actually every 23 and a half hours, because there's supposed to be something magical about doing it before 24 hours. I don't know whether that's true or not, but there's a couple of people that claim that that is true. So I did that. So far, it is working perfectly. The guy that gave up on the printer asked me if he could send it to me. I said, you know, well, uh, finally I said, okay, send it to me. He paid for the shipping. I received it. I saw the UPS man literally toss it on my front steps. Yeah, I was a little bit shocked about that. I pushed it back in, 70 pounds. My back is killing me. I can't carry that kind of weight, especially an awkward box like that. I slid it down the stairs, set it up, plugged it in. Damn, if it didn't power up and everything is fine. And after nozzle check and head alignment, I printed this. Well, it's upside down. They are blowing up a hot air balloon. Look at that. Absolutely perfect color. No banding whatsoever anywhere. Perfect. Hey, Joe, is that you in the middle there, right? Right holding the flames? Here, let me let me let me jump over to you. All right. Yep. No, no. The, regarding the picture, that guy's got a lot of hot air, huh? I <laughs> no, I got yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, the thing is, I felt really bad. And I did, I, you know, I talked to you about that, Mike. Yeah. I called you up and talked to you. And um, I did finally contact him the other night and explain that, you know, I could have just lied and said, hey, it doesn't work. Ha ha, wink, wink. And I installed my other printhead. But no, I had to be honest. That's that's me. So I explained to him what happened. And you know what he told me? Give it a good home. So now I have two pro ones. I have plenty of uh, cartridges to use on it. So I'm going to go ahead and use it, and who knows what will happen. I mean, it's that that printer is a little bit unpredictable in its behavior. So anyway, what are you okay. doing now, Mike? Okay, uh, I just noticed something. Yep. The display goes away by itself after a period of no use. It dims itself. Nice green programming. That'll save a few trees. Right. The, uh, yeah, I noticed that with the um, 1,500 as well. 15,000. It goes dim, and I have to press the button to revive it again. So does the, uh, the 8320. Okay, well, so here's a nozzle check. On uh, uh, Can we get focus, focus, focus? Yeah, okay. There you go. Oh, look at that. It's no longer the uh, regular. That's a Pro 1000. Right. Right. Yes. It's got the stir step nozzle. Yeah, chamber. that's good. All right. That is good. No longer the bars from the Pro 100 on top. 100. Yeah. Guys, I'm a little bit cheap, so I always use bad paper on the other side. That's fine. Nozzle checks. Uh, that's me. You can forgive okay, me. Okay. And you got a very, very uh, probably the. Second iteration. Move it so we can see the um, version number. 1.02. 1.02. Yep. Third page printed. Yeah. Okay. So the nozzle check to my eyes look fine. I think to you, does it look fine to your eyes? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you would see one of those little crosses, you know, be gone. And yeah. so that looks good to me. So Having gone through a nozzle check, what is it time to do? We lift the lid. All right. Let's see how much ink we've gone through. Cover is open. You're going to have to zoom back out. Uh, zoom back zoom out a little bit. Out. Yeah. All right. Mike, somebody was asking me about how do I remove a printhead? How do and apparently the reverse the way we yeah, yeah the yeah. reverse of the process but this is because people bought it already set up from someone okay and so that that part is never conveyed to me <laughs> you know so i have to pull teeth to be able to get that information so there it is. Well, when a pro 100 you just open the lid that's it 
and go through the process that he just went through, unclamp it and pull the head out carefully, of course. And do not touch that electronic contact plate. So we're going to figure out how much ink was actually used up in the initial priming of the printhead. I find the Pro 100 is quite frugal, actually. And it's, the Pro 10 is not bad either. Is the Pro 1 was a dog. Um, Pro 1000, I think it's not as bad as the Pro 1. So, Mike, how does it look internally? Does it look well built? I'll take you there. Yeah. Just let me do my wing. And we'll get there soon. Because sometimes you can actually look inside and see where, let's just put it this way, where money was uh, saved. Well, there's no money saved. I paid less price for this puppy. <laughs> so, so would you call that uh, a tank, like the Pro 100? It's not bad. Like not the, bad? The same comments to my... Let's put it this way. It's certainly better built than the XP 15,000. Okay, sure, of course. Okay. We're talking about $300, 350 Right. You get what you pay for. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, if you take good care of a fifteen thousand, I, I don't, yeah, see any, yeah. I don't see any. Because you see, the Pro One Hundred printer for consumers, remember, was overbuilt. Guys yeah. use the Pro One Hundred and they run commercial operations for thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, and they run it for years. No consumer is going to do that. Yeah. So it was way overbuilt for the average consumer. Once you keep that in mind, then you go, hey, it's like um, you buy a, a truck to go to the supermarket to buy groceries. It's way overbuilt. Yeah. Some people will say, I don't need it, but many people do do that with their truck. I see a lot of people on a you know Ford F-150 that has never seen an ounce of work in the... Um, tailgate well most SUVs, SUVs never see off-road anyways you know as well I often wonder wow what are you lacking sir that you need something like that you know okay so let's go inside <laughs> right yep let's let me take right my in. camera off uh let me yeah let me take my camera off and we'll show you inside hopefully I don't drop this camera You already weighed the cartridges? Yep. Okay. I weighed them. You want to see the, the, the con consumption? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So let me, l l let me do an average here. Let me, do, let me do an operation here. I didn't put in this function before. Now, what is the total volume of ink? that 4.7 ml how much 4.7 for setup total yeah yeah okay from the start which is to prime the print head run the alignment and print a nozzle check so three pages we printed 4.7 which is not bad yeah well that includes setup you know yeah so we will we'll do the other one, but getting back to the inside, let me see what I can do to see a better view of the internals. Let me... You know it's going to probably move to the right again on you. That's okay. I'm not worried about it. It'll do nothing. It'll just go there and realize there's no cartridges. Mm -hmm. Tell me to open the print, the cover back up, and put some in. No harm done. No sweat. No worries. 
Um, it appears that the the absorbers are full width. So I'm looking at the five by five wireless. I mean the borderless issue. Mm -hmm. Try that. Uh, no construction issues at all. I can really complain about. So yeah, once you get back back in. once you get the driver installed, then you can check because this printer supposedly has. A, a bit more choices for borderless printing for those of you who want to print borderless. I think I was looking at this in a couple of other printers that will be very um, popular with the crafting community. Those of you who do book scrapping or scrapbooking, I should call it. And that, that craft uses certain standard sizes, 12 by 12, 8 by 8. And I believe five by five as well. So they're square size papers and they have a need to print borderless. And normally you cannot do that. You just simply cannot do that. So I think they have introduced those sizes in some of these new printers that will make it really popular for those who are into that style of crafting. They have to situate uh, sponges on the platen to take into account those lengths, those widths, I should say. So I think now you can you have um, the ability to print borderless eight by 10, so that eight inch width is already taken into account, but there was never one for the um, 12. So okay. so now it's gonna do, let's see how long it takes for it to, um, I'll let it go down. I'll let it settle down. Done, right? That's it? That's it. Wow. Let me print one nozzle check again, and then I'll lift the cartridges. And see how much ink was consumed. You really want to do that? Why not? Okay. Yeah. It might be pretty minuscule. That's interesting, though. I We need to find out the amount of ink used just simply by removing and popping back in. Why don't you just and not here, print it? Why don't you just... Not, yeah. Why don't you just not print anything? No, no. I, I need to initiate the priming cycle. Okay. All right. You hear it? Yeah. Okay. Now, people watching, they've got to understand, every time you mess with the cartridges, you put down the lid, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do about it. Now, Mike, I'm theorizing, you correct me if you think I'm wrong, that because the printhead is floating on the center portion, and you remove a cartridge. Now you have exposed the plate, the nozzle plate, as well as the entry ports for ink. Is there any possibility of air getting in at that point? Very unlikely because the car, the, the, the Canon ink conduction system is done by surface tension okay. and touch. So you think this is only done as a precautionary? Precautionary yes. step, yeah. Yes. Because an Epson, you know, fourteen hundred will do the same thing. At twenty eight eighty, will do the same thing. Okay, so printed a nozzle check. Let me get rid of this thing. Is it perfect? Yeah, it's it's perfect as expected. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna lift the lid now. It's settled. Wait. Okay, it's settled. So let me take out the cartridges and we will wait. 
and then we'll know exactly how much it gets consumed in our planning. Again, viewers have to understand, even if you replace one cartridge, this is what's going to happen to all of them. All of them, yes. After I wait, I'll show you the So we are going to compare the difference in weight pre and post and see how much actual amount of ink was used up in those reinitialization, whatever you want to call it, pre-purge, whatever. That will occur every single time. And it only seems to occur on printers that have piggyback type cartridges that ride on top of the printhead assembly. Those are actually the best printers to use for testing different types of ink that are compatible with a similar model. Say, for example, if I was testing um, inks for a P800, I could use my 2880 with refillable cartridges, do a quick test comparison between two different types of inks. As long as I have two sets of cartridges refilled, I can just pop them in, run a quick cleaning cycle, the previous ink is flushed out. I can then compare that ink and the new cartridges, make a direct comparison. You could possibly do that on a printer such as the P800 because you have ink living inside the printer. Still, a lot of ink that would have to be flushed out. The same thing on a Pro 1000. There's no way you're going to use, you know, waste all that ink. Okay. That's why when you choose to refill on the Pro 1000, you want an ink set that you're not going to detect the difference when it finally reaches the printhead, okay? I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, I switched to these inks. I popped the cartridges ink in into my Pro 1000. I printed a couple of prints, and they were marvelous. No, dummy, you're still printing with OEM inks. Okay, You haven't really seen the effects of that new inks that you just installed. That's going to take forever, okay, before you see it. And by the time you see it, too late if it's not a good... If it's not a good, um, happy ending, let's just put it that way, by that time it's too late. So you need an ink set that's going to be completely seamless. You will not see the difference. So as you guys can see, it's popping the newly reweighed cartridges back in. And I think it's going to show us the differences in weight. And again, remember, this is just the difference between the previous weight and then after replacing them, it ran a little bit of a uh, purge. We're going to see how much ink was actually used. What is that in the middle there? Again, folks, don't hesitate to continue okay. chatting with each other on the chat. I will be with you once we get done with all of this. Okay, so I just put it back in. Yep. And let me show you the results. All right. I got to take it off. Drum, drum roll. Ta -da. Two point nine ml over eight cartridges, an average of 0.36. Okay, so okay, give or take with the accuracy of the scale, etc. Say 0.4 ml per tank on a prime. Yeah, it's exactly the same the Pro 100 uses. Okay, and it's no surprise because it's using the same printhead. Yeah. So the the priming sequence is going to be a function primarily of the printhead design. Right, so it's, there's no surprises there. So it's 0.4 ml times um, 8. So about 3 ml or so, give or take. So do you, let, let me ask you a question. Do you think it was a little bit of a sneaky move by Canon to use an opaque plastic 
to um, mold those cartridges? Yeah, well, listen. Or was there a good reason for it? Let me put something to print. Out. Let me talk to you about that. Because this goes back over 10 years as to what the progression of the situation. This goes back 10 years. And I'm, I'm also going to time the, this print as well. You already connected to the computer, right? You already installed a driver? Yep, yep. Okay, yep. good. I am going to... It's quite a quick process. I have found um, this past year I had to, um, I got a new hard drive and I, you know, reinstalled Windows and I did all of the updates. I did everything, all the programs that I needed to reinstall. And then I began to install drivers and it was like that. I mean, so quick. It was just ridiculous how quick it was. The days of, you know, taking minutes and minutes to install a driver for a printer are pretty much over. Well, don't forget you got a SSD and you got a fast CPU. Yeah, too, sure. Right? Yeah, of course. That makes a humongous difference. Okay. But folks, just make sure that, you know, when you... If you receive a CD with your printer and you're not sure whether that's the latest one, just go to the Canon or Epson site, download the latest driver, not the combo package, the driver, because the combo package might sneak in a, you know, some kind of a updater that you may not realize is going to perform little actions on you behind your back. You don't want to update your firmware if you're going to be refilling, just to be safe. Um, just install the driver and then install any other applications manually that you may want to have installed, such as for you know, the Canon PSP or the, you know, Print Studio Pro or one of the higher end layout programs that they have available. Just do it manually. Well, I so saw something move. Yeah, it's starting to do a print. Okay. So what was the question you had asked before I was? Oh, the uh, opaqueness of the cartridges. What's that? Oh, something? yes, 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 yes. Um, this started off in the late 2000s. Remember, there was a cartridge on a desktop called a 220, 221 that had an opaque body, except for in the, in the reservoir area, they had a little clear window. Mm-hmm. That was superseded by the 226 cartridge when Canon went completely opaque. And a lot of people wonder, why would Canon do this? I theorized it did this because what happened was when the cartridge on the 221 said there was half full, the liquid reservoir side was already empty or pretty much empty. Mm -hmm. So people would call into Canon and say, hey, something's wrong with the cartridge. You're telling me it's, it's half full, but I'm not seeing it. It's empty. Send me a new one. It's a defective. Yeah. Well, people would call in and wonder why that is happening. And as you know, on the Pro 100, the same thing is happening as well. Mm -hmm. That the reservoir side doesn't always show exactly what the chip is telling you. Yeah, and people would get all confused. So from their standpoint, if we don't show you anything, you won't know, and you won't complain about anything. Right. Because complaining and asking people to answer the phone about that takes up, you know, it's costing Canon money. Yeah, well, that's that because people literally um, think that the sponge should be fully depleted of any any ink before it is declared empty and really that is not possible you have to maintain a certain amount of ink in that sponge otherwise you'll have to run that looks beautiful that looks perfectly neutral at least to my eyes well 
from a print speed standpoint, I think it's about the same as the Pro 100. Yeah. Not nothing. If it's different, it's nothing to write home about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now here's the acid test. Pro 100, Pro 200. Mm -hmm. Lower it down a little bit. Pro 100, Pro 200. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll do it right here. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes if you have it um, different positions, you can see uh, the effect of lighting. So the claim that I saw, if you recall, we, we, we were chatting privately online, and I showed you that Canon was claiming and basically realizing what you noticed already long before any of this came out. The res on the strawberry, remember? You bet. The res on the strawberry with the OEM Pro 100 inks were not printing red. We're printing reddish, but more like orange. And the orange. SE ink and, I brought yeah, up. And when you times. first sent me that first sample of SE inks and I tested them, and I had really, I have to admit to you that I really wasn't expecting something fabulous to be the result. I printed them, I was like, you can, you guys can go back and look at my videos on that, okay? And I did that real time, and I showed everybody my shock, okay, when I saw the results. And you noticed something immediately. And you noticed something with the cyan rendition and also the reds. The reds on the OEM ink, those strawberries were orangey. Okay, and your ink set printed them red the way you see them on the monitor. Now, enter Canon with the Pro, the Pro 200. First release of the specs. They specifically addressed that. They did. They showed, <laughs> you, they showed you the same strawberries with the Pro 100 ink, and now what they are going to look like with the Pro 200 inks. From orangey to red. Well, right. hell, I think someone else did that prior to what we are experiencing now. I won't mention who that is, of course. We'll keep that a secret. <laughs> what do you have to say about that? Well, here's my conclusion, Joe. I mean, here, here, here's the proof. If you got a Pro 100... Should I upgrade to a Pro 200? If you're refilling, no. The SD ink set in the Pro 100 in the red area will give you what the Pro 200 finally gives you. So we beat them to the punch, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, but I love that LCD screen, man. I really do. Well, it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars. I, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Center. Damn. Okay. Well. And don't forget this brush feel. I know. And it probably yeah. smell. It probably yeah. smells a little better, too. Let's let's not be too harsh. There's some okay, guys who get, didn't buy. Who did who, who were unable to acquire Pro 100. So, But the lowdown is this. If you can get a used Pro 100 in very good condition, that might be a better buy for the refiller. Yeah. Especially if he uses my signature edition inks. Yeah. Now because he won't miss any performance color wise that Canon is giving him on the pro giving that person that him or her on right. the pro 200. Okay. That that's, that's perfectly fine. But let's, let's go ahead and assume that someone has a pro 200 and yeah, they're impressed, and yeah, they would love to refill. Is there any solution to the Pro 200 in a refillable sense? Can, yeah. can you just retrofit 
the CLI-41 cartridges with Pro 200 chips for recognition purposes? And can you disable ink monitoring? Something, something that can be done. Is there going to be a resetter available? What are the chances of that happening? Okay, let me tell you something. I forgot. I forgot. I'm going to have to waste ink here. Oh, I forgot to do this earlier. It's going to cost me a quarter of a cartridge. Here's a CLI-42. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pop it in here. Let's see if the cartridge fits. That's what everybody's asking about. Let me put you in full. So it fits Folks, now. Is the light flashing at all? There's no. There's look here. It's showing nothing. Nothing. So it will not take a CLI forty two chip. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get that straight. But the body of a CLI forty two will fit. fit in the printer. So here's what, from from a refilling standpoint, one can do. First off. At this point in time, Red Setter has no response, or they're still working on it, I should say. They're still trying to see if they can make a resetter for okay. That's the, the company that that's the company that currently makes resetters for the Pro 100 and the Pro 10. Right. So at this point, every day the light is getting dimmer with respect to them having a resetter that's mm -hmm. not to say it's impossible it, they may have a breakthrough we can't determine whether or not they will or won't right mm -hmm. but as time goes along it's been weeks now weeks and they still ha don't have any progress on the resetter now do they have printers on hand to yeah they do they do okay yeah they do so what with that in mind, then we have to figure out, can we refill this, this printer in the future? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just like on the 8320, you have, we can refill the OEM tanks. We drill a hole, we move a plug or move the ball, put it back in it, and we override or disable the chip. And we, we have, we'll go through that another day. Yeah. Okay, but the key thing to remember is this: the other, but you'll have to weigh them. If you use the black tags, you'll have to weigh them. It's best you weigh them to determine how much ink to put in there. If you want to keep the process neat, All right? Otherwise, you get clear tanks from the CLI eight or CLI forty two, and you transfer the chips from the Pro 200 tanks onto these. So when you refill them, you don't need to use a scale. Yeah. You can see what's going on. Because you, you really need to monitor how that ink permeates the sponge, folks. Okay? Yeah. To, to, to at least give you a good feeling as to what ink delivery is going to be like. You have to, yeah. you have to realize that. Now, Mike, the chip that you would transfer from the CLI, what is it, 75? 65. 65 to the 41s, that, that is just there for recognition purposes, right? Because you're going to disable it, the ink monitoring part of it. Yeah, it, you're going to disable it, but Canon wants to make sure that there's a cartridge present. Right, with and the, the correct way to, and And only if it sees a chip, whether it's functioning as a full chip or an overridden chip, it must see a chip right. for the printer to work. You know, unless awesome. some bright person comes up with a chipless solution for a Canon, no, then we can. I don't see that know. coming. But uh, yeah. So again, you know, from a refiller standpoint, if you want to refill and own a printer, 
should you buy a 200 or should you pay a, a high price and get a new inbox pro 100 mm. or use 100 well if you're going to refill i personally would go to the 100 but let's suppose you can't get a hold of a 100 and you want new is there, is there an alternative for a Pro 200? And I think you've got it right behind you, right there, Joe. XP 15,000, folks. For the vast majority of consumers, that might be actually a better printer at this point in time. You keep talking. Okay, because... The key thing is it has a, a maintenance box you can replace. It's easy to refill, and there's no maintenance on the tanks. So you may end up wasting a little more ink by not having chips or resetter. But that is mitigated by the fact that you can buy a, a maintenance box or waste ink tank for 10 bucks. Yep. Which in the scheme of things is not a lot of money. Which is what will kill your printer anyway. It will stop yeah. working. So people who want to refill and want to own a photo printer may want to consider getting a 15,000. Now, Joe brought up a very, very important point about the Pro 200, and that is crafting. 5x5 five five and 12x12 12 12 borderless. Mm-hmm. It appears that the 15,000 can do 5x5 five five borderless, but cannot do 12x12. 12 12. Mm. And you know, unless there's... I tried going through the settings, and I couldn't make it do it. But let me go through the settings as we speak here on the Pro 100, and let me confirm whether it's doable. Okay, the reason that question even came up my daughter, she's a scrapbooker, and she does have a very good uh, color laser printer that's able to do borderless and 12 by 12 stock. So she buys blank paper. You know, you can go to the art shop and buy already pages for your scrapbooking already pre-printed. But she likes to design her pages. In the old days, they would actually physically cut borders and ribbons and photos and actually paste them onto these pages which is doing it digitally and she wants to be able to then print these pages borderless without a border so that would be the only reason to have something like that are you ready mike yeah i gave the thumbs up because i it yeah. confirmed the pro 200 will do 12 by 12 borderless all right there you go so that's a huge selling point right there for a certain yeah. group of people for people who do a lot of crafting and who yeah. want a 12 by 12 borders and don't want to trim, that's the way to do it. But you're paying and a all, premium yeah, for All you got to do is put it in borderless mode and then just check your paper right. sizes. What what you actually, the, what pops up? Yeah. And you buy the paper already trimmed 12 by 12, you pop it in there yeah. and you, you print. Otherwise, you got to use a 13 by 19, print 12 by 12 and do some trimming. Trim it. No good. Um, Red River already has papers already pre-sized to those dimensions. And by the way, I'm about to contact uh, Drew from Red River to possibly make another appearance here and tell us what's new. What's new? That would be very interesting in 2021 to see what they have on the uh, on track for us. Yeah, so there we have it. Pro 200. And um, works. What I'll have to work on now is getting, making sure that there's an ink set for it that works well. Yeah. And um, so, Mike, uh, later on when you get a chance, remember you were concerned about the look of one of the uh, ports. It's working fine. Yeah, you so can have a look at it and see if it actually got um, saturated the way you should have. Well, I'm not going to open it again. No, no, so not now. That would be a waste of ink. Oh, it's a waste of ink. And, you know, OEM ink is not cheap. And I got to make sure, sure I do some prints 
so that I have a reference for my refillings, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so we've been waiting so, for this day for a long time. Uh, here's so, another anomaly. On the Pro 100, Canon specs the print head with a drop droplet size of, what, three picoliter. On the Pro 200, interestingly, with the same print head, they're specifying a droplet size of 0. 0.4. Okay. I don't know 0. if it's, it's a marketing error. Or Usually it's 0. 0.5. The, if they if they claim that I have a half of a picoliter droplet. Hmm. Is that same 0. 0.5 now? I don't know. Well, it, the droplet size were, were different. So initially when we were, I was looking at the Pro 200, I wasn't sure. Yeah. That was the print head that was different because the Pro 100 droplet size is spec differently from a Pro 200. Right, but that would so, be just the, the 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 smallest possible droplet because doesn't it have variable droplet technology? No, I don't think so. It doesn't? Oh, that's no, interesting. I don't think so on the Canon, no. Okay. I don't think so. I, I, I can't confirm it. Canon never really tells you exactly what's going on, but mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think so. I know the, the other thing too, it's important for users to look at here or understand droplet size does not determine resolution. Right. 0.4 picoliter, 0.3 picoliter, 0.2 picoliter, or one picoliter. None of these droplets you can see with the naked eye. Right. Okay. And also depends on the media and the amount of wicking. Right. And the dot gain, et cetera. The but dot gain. But five picoliter, as you can't see with the naked eye. Right. So it's a marketing it's ploy, Mike. It's just a, a, a marketing ploy to, you know, get the buyers that are not technically informed to purchase something because, you know, oh, it has a nanometer size droplet, you know, <laughs> big deal. Yeah. You can't see it. Yeah, so so those people who 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 want to rate printers based on droplet size, get with the times. Yeah, that's over. You've been had. Get real. You've been had for a long time. Understand it has nothing to do with that anymore. I mean, if you're doing fifteen picoliters, twenty picoliters, yeah, but in in the photo printer range, there's a lot more going on than the picoliters. And it has more to do with the print engine than the droplet size, okay? So it's just like um, cameras, megapixels, megapixels. Yeah. My little, my little compact has more megapixels than this full-frame sensor. But so it's got to be better than the full-frame sensor, right? Right. That's a it's Well, you know, you, it's a combination. You have to have a, a lens that has enough resolving power. Right. To take into account or take an, into advantage that high megapixel count on your sensor. If you have a fuzzy lens, I don't care if you have a million megapixel. It's still fuzzy. It's just gonna be fuzzy. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, a, it's a marketing ploy. All right, man. Um, so in gosh, the future, we'll we'll go over the overriding. Mm-hmm. We'll go over what it means to override on a refilling basis. We'll address the nasty message you got about whether printers refilling was going to kill your printer in no time. Because we've done the measurements. We've seen it. I didn't fudge it. 0.4 ml per tank. Every time you lift the lid. And what does it mean when you replace one tank at a time? Yeah. I mean, the that, math will tell you right there. You can't deny the math, you know. Yeah, that's what that data woman, said. You got to follow the science. Well, you got to follow the math. That's what that person could not understand. Yeah. yeah anyway, okay. So and I think the next time you were going to talk about something about the Pro 1000, I know you had oh, some yeah, yeah, yeah. big to do about the Pro 1000. Yeah, the Pro 1000, uh, it's, it's going to become a very important printer for a lot of people. And also our approach to making these 
tanks a lot easier to refill. Yeah. When we go, if you if you choose to go with a uh, no ink monitoring system, yeah. it'll be quite easy to keep track of and uh, nothing to really to worry about as far as um, you know running out of ink unsuspectingly. No. Uh, some practices that we'll have to um, begin to use. And um, the refilling will be super simple. We will not have to do the pressurization method or the vacuum method any longer. We'll just be refilling them like they were refillable cartridges. And that should be, yeah. And I'm crossing my fingers, but maybe towards the end of the year, uh, this summer, I will work on a project related to the Pro 1000 that's going to be very important. Okay. Okay. I so think I, I know what you're base. talking about. Yeah, that will keep and that. Two up. years ago, we tried the SIS. Yeah. And we failed. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at it with another, from another angle. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to so, me. You guys, have the rest of the evening. With All Joe, right. and again, happy Valentine's, boys and yep. girls. Not All right. Girls. Okay. All right. We'll see you the next time, Mike. See you then. And I'll be calling you soon. All right. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. Always exciting, right? Uh, we didn't get to see Mike today, though. That's too bad. Let me go back to the beginning here. we got to start thanking everyone who has decided to come on board. We have currently 76 people watching. Now, on the very top... Okay, on the very top, I pasted the links to the QImage 1 for Windows and Mac and QImage Ultimate only for Windows with my new affiliate link. Again, please, if you consider buying QImage, and if you're on the border sitting on the fence, get the 14-day trial. It's not a complete, it doesn't have the complete uh, set of, um, I think, functionality. But it will give you an idea what QImage is like. Then if you choose to buy it, get it for a 10% discount by using my links. And you will be helping the channel because we are now officially affiliated with QImage. And again, it's not I'm not doing this to make money or anything like that. They offer me this and I accepted it because I have been a QImage user for probably a good 18 years. Okay. And I have never um, gone to anything else because to me, there's really nothing better at this point. All right. So we had Harold Goldberg. He was here early on at 2.49 p.m. He was here. So cool and icy Richmond uses a Pro 100. Here it's been icy for the last two and a half days. And so it's been raining, not raining, it's been just sleeting and freezing rain. And today it warmed up. My car was completely engulfed in a beautiful layer of ice and now it just looks like it just came out of the uh, car wash so it's spanky clean and free of any any kind of ice i don't know what the temperature went up to but it was good enough to uh, melt everything rob van gelder i haven't seen you for a long time and he is let me put this here i keep forgetting to do that he said that one of the results of Brexit is that buying ink and refilling supplies in the UK is no longer meaningful for customers in 27 EU or European Union countries because of the sky high shipping import and customs. That's, yeah, well, what can I say? What can I say? There I am. I'm asking everyone to tell me where you're from. And of course, Wendy is here, Belgium. Sorry, she couldn't make it last Saturday. That's fine. No problem at all. Glad to have you back. Royce Bay, Canada. And uh, is that your son with a camera? Yeah. Or maybe that's you. For Canon Pro 1000. Awesome. Pixel Trainer. I love that. Hi, Jose. Photo art by Ryan. Wow, that's a gorgeous photograph, man. Hi, Jose. Thanks again for the video chat this morning. Oh, okay. You're the guy that I was speaking with. Awesome. Glad to have you here. Now, we were going to talk about the Pro 1000, but Mike got very involved with this uh, B, uh, the uh, Pro 200 because it kind of arrived surprise like. I mean, it just showed up. He didn't think it was going to get it in about another maybe two weeks. 
as he explained. It'll be the next time. We'll have Mike back on. Charles Verbruggen, hello, Antwerp, Belgium, 9500 Mark II. We're working on a different system for the Pro 1000, okay? Okay, we tried once and failed, but that did not stop us. And that's going to be groundbreaking, okay? Think about that. Gordon Duke from Scotland, Epson XP15000, waiting on Epson P900. Awesome. Now, as you guys are aware, I have my XP15000 running chipless, okay? So it's all a matter of every month removing the cartridges and topping them off to a 27 gram weight. So again, they are opaque. They are opaque, but you can fill them, I mean, liberally by squirting ink into the port and the ink gets immediately absorbed. The trick is never wait until they are empty. Right now, we will not know at all if they ever are empty because the chips are always reporting as if they were full. So every month I got to systematically top them all off. But it works beautifully, man. Bart Ivar Fleischborg, Canon Pro 1. And you, you guys saw what I just got, right? A Canon Pro 1 from a user that he couldn't get it to work. And by the time it arrived to me, it was working perfectly. I kind of felt bad. But this is the result. Okay, it's just gorgeous. This looks exactly like on my monitor. So, again, we'll just give it a good home, put it to work to produce some good prints. Roger Jones from getting a greeting from stuck in the ice and snow, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon gets ice and snow? I didn't know that. I thought that was all rain up there in the upper western part of this country. That's a very wet area. Um, Ryan says, Laredo, Texas, USA. Yes. And he's got a Pro 1000. We talked about that. We talked about the Pro 1000. We had a great time chatting. I hope I was able to help him out. And uh, Edmund Rogers, I'm sitting next to my Epson 7600 that I just successfully, I think, cleaned the heads thanks to Jose on the other side. Now, after years of OEM ink purchases, I'm confident enough to switch to refills. You should be able to get some good refillable cartridges for that printer. Those older printers are unlocked, and you can use whatever ink you choose to use. Just be careful. Be careful the way you uh, set up the cartridges so that they are flowing correctly. John Palermo from Montreal, Canada. All right. And he says hi to Mike. Yeah, Mike is up there in the Canadian area as well. Calligraphy Johnson from Chicago, Epson 3800, 1430 hobby user. 1430 is a great printer. It's a dye six color printer. Again, fabulous. Nikos is here with us. He's got a, a TM200 and a 8350, which is just like my 8320 that is upstairs right now. I'm working beautifully. No cleaning cycles prior to printing. What's going on? I have no idea. So it's not true about all Canon printers, apparently. Dom Sim from Des Moines, Iowa, 7880. That's a big one right there, but a good one. An oldie but goodie. Randall Dodds, soaked Tarpon Springs, Florida. So you guys getting a lot of rain down there? We've been given a reprieve. I think the uh, bad weather is finally gone. Rather be soaked than in than this minus seven weather. Yeah, I'll take that anytime. Somebody showed me a picture of uh, temperatures in Alaska, temperatures in the North Pole, in the South Pole, and then Nebraska was like minus 37 or some ridiculous someplace in Nebraska, I think it was. Big game, James. Solana Beach, California. I use Canon Pro 100, and I order equipment and supplies from B&H. Again, really a good company. Apparently, I mean, they got this printer up to Mike in no time. He couldn't get one locally, okay? That's why he had to cancel that order. Jamie Gannon, Chicago, Epson 1430. Awesome. Edmund Rogers, Randall, I'll send you some 
28 degrees snow. You send me some 75 degree rain, I'll send it next day by air. Awesome. Henning Mikkel, Mikkel, Michael. Um, Henning from Norway here, got my Pro 1000 one week ago. I am new to the group and looking forward to using it. I believe that's what you meant. Again, awesome printer, my friend. George, I'm not going to say that last name. I can't pronounce it. From Cyprus. Again, that's gorgeous, gorgeous place. Canon Pro 10S and Pro 1000. Wow, you guys got some good printers, man. Richard Bender, all right, from Hagerstown. And we're going to hook up. You want to do next week? Let me know. You want to do next week? I am open to have you next week. I can't believe I'm speaking so well today with the pain that I was going through this morning. This side is completely healed. I think most of it. Edwin Rogers. Anyone have experience with ink out pigment inks? After 10 years, I'm just getting back into printing my work and my Epson 2200, 7600. Okay. So we have our first question of the evening. Inkal, excellent inks, okay? No problem whatsoever. They're just not as perfectly tweaked as precision colors, okay? But they're a little bit lower cost. Uh, they get their inks from STS, from Image Specialist, and basically they're just the, the ink set that they produce without tweaking. It's close enough, folks. For some folks, no difference whatsoever between OEM and those inks, okay? Those particular, I call them generic sets. But that doesn't mean they're low quality. That just means that it's the set without any further tweaking that they develop for a given printer model. But yeah, I highly recommend uh, Inkal. I just got lost here a second. Let me, okay, here we go. Ted, Ted, New Jersey, Pro 100, OEM inks, just starting to play with Red River and Canson Infinity sample packs of paper. Again, folks, you want to sample papers? You want to see what a paper of this type of surface looks like on this particular image? Sample packs. Get those sample packs. Per sheet, it'll be a lot less than buying even a box, okay? So get several of these packs. Red River has them for like $9 each and so you can get i think they offer three different styles of packs and then you can get packs from other companies as well and just have fun printing see which combination works for you let me show you something this was on the xp 15000 this is on this again that's a oh sorry okay got too much stuff here in the way okay so Epson printer on Canon paper. Okay, this is my daughter's house. Okay, big, big old house. If you've seen any of my drone videos, this is where I fly around. Okay, 15,000 with precision colors inks. Gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. Identical. I shot that with a drone, by the way. Now, 15,000 with some high end paper. This is Red River. I believe it was San Gabriel. I thought it was Palo Duro, but this is San Gabriel 1.0. And I think Palo Duro now is producing the same type of paper under a different name, but XP 15,000. Okay, gorgeous. Can you get neutral results? Of course you can. Let me flip this upside down. I mean, right side up. This was done by one of our viewers here. The image that is, I printed it live on one of our live streams, and it was thrilled to see it. I still have it here. Again, the 15,000 six-color printer, six-ink printer, and it's dye inks, and it produces results like that. The, the standard image came out fantastic, okay? And I'm running sort of half OEM, half PCSE inks on it, okay, at this point. So I think I'm due for another topping off in another couple of weeks so we'll do that and see how much ink i have actually used up i'm going to keep track to see how much ink i have to actually put in because what I, what I will be doing is setting the cartridge on a scale and whatever it weighs if it's under 27 grams i will add enough ink to get to that level 
and then I'll know exactly how much ink I'm adding. Jerry. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Poland. Pro 10, Pro 100, Pro 10S. So you got both of them? Wow. And running PCSE. So I'm glad you were able to get those out there. Okay, because uh, Mike sort of is was under the fence at that time to uh, ship overseas. Peter, Peter Buries. I'm sorry. I apologize. Hello, Czech Republic. Wow. I think that's the first. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to see you here. Hank Junkman from Cromwell, Connecticut here. Uh, loving my Canon Pro 1000. First, my first low ink warning just came on for the CO, the Chroma Optimizer cartridge. How many more prints do you think I'll get before it is empty? Well, at this point, it has probably around, I would say around 50 milliliters of ink in it. So just print until it reaches empty. Make sure you have a spare waiting on the aisles. You can go until it's empty, okay? No need to worry. Yeah, see, 15. I said 15, but it's about 18 also. It depends. See, the Pro 1000 is not like the lower class Pro 100 for that for that matter. It has an optical prism and i know mike wanted to explain that but it would take like maybe half an hour to do that what the uh, function of the optical prism is but it just helps to uh verify that that liquid chamber this side this side of the cartridge reaches empty if i could shine a light from behind you could see the prism right here you can see it right there okay on the pro 200 cartridges that is blocked off there is no prism so a light is shining through their little beam and it gets diffracted or diverted when there's air showing up that means it's getting to the point where there's no more ink here so again a really um innovating way to determine at what point that cartridge has reached reached low because you can't really count on the print hit the number of droplets ejected versus how many ml those up you know you really can't so you have to you have to rely on something more mechanical to at least verify that yeah you're low because now i can see air okay so that's how it does it yeah i you know continue printing no problem i have like eight of them right now as well on my pro 1000 hot live or live live yeah uh what's the difference between pixma and image program well pixma is the consumer or prosumer level and image program is professional level okay that's what they mean it's just it's just terminology that canon invented ives he has is there a, some sys for the pro 100 actually there is and i don't know whether you're i think you may not be here in the usa maybe um but um a company called ink products inkproducts.com has a sys and i've been considering buying one just to have it because it's supposed to be really good anything else I would not touch, okay? Only the ink products, sis. Visi today says, hi all. Jerry Longle says, happy Valentine's from freezing. Minus 25, Canada, Canon Pro 100. Oh, too cold for me. RSDumfyPhotography.com. Hey, Jose, love your stuff. Thank you. I'm glad. Today wasn't really much my stuff. It was mostly Mike, and I uh, really enjoyed the fact that he he was going to do uh, Pro 1000 today. That's what we're going to talk about. But all of a sudden, his printer showed up. So I think he's going to have some fun with that. He says also that my house is plastered with my printed photos. Well, I don't have a lot of wall space because that's for my wife. 
Okay, she uh, has all her decorations and she loves to do Legos. So we have a bunch of uh, glass cabinets with all her Lego creations. So instead of flower, flowers and, and perfume and jewelry, guess what she gets? Books and Legos and keeps her happy. And when she's happy, I'm happy. Bernhard Moore, Southington, Connecticut, happy with my pro 100. I'm glad that everybody still repeats the same thing. That means they're still happy with their printers. Visi today, I'm interested in what affects the daily on clock does. The daily on clock, you mean that that print that I generate with a Q image ultimate. It keeps your printer exercised. That's all it does. Right here. And this is custom made set of colors, basically matching whatever the ink palette for your particular printer is. So you get the choice of yellow, orange, red, I believe even green, blue, and then magenta, cyan, and of course your black. So uh, your grays are covered in the black anyway. So um, you create a custom perch sheet or image like that, depending on your printer's colors. And then you then schedule your printer. You have to generate a schedule. And um, my Pro 1000, for instance, I do one every day, every day. So that will keep that printer from really, even though I'm doing this every day, it's not really generating many cleaning cycles at all, okay? So it sort of tends to reduce those, okay? Because it doesn't have to anymore. So um, something even better when you're away for a week, set it to do a whole week's work. When you come home, you have to leave your Q image open. Right now it's minimized. I just have it minimized. And I leave my printer on. If it does a reboot because a Windows update occurred at midnight, then of course I'll have to open it back up. And immediately it just loads that schedule once again. So all my printers are running on a schedule right now. And so that just keeps everything extra. Otherwise, you know what happens? I forget to print, okay? Just like everyone else. I'm just as guilty of it. So anyway, it just really helps your printer to stay exercise. Like I said, if you're away on a short vacation or a long vacation for that matter, you can set it for every couple of days, every three days or so. Um, just hope that the power doesn't go out, you know. Frank Romero, I never liked that printer. Which printer are you not liking, Frank? The Pro 200? The 100, the 1,000, which one? We see today says I need an F-150 to buy from Costco. Yes, actually, you know what? That that would allow you to load a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? No, I just I just get a kick out of watching these uh, F-150s that are luxury trucks. I mean, they don't see a, a a grain of dirt. Okay, they're just you know a man's toy. And, you know, they're they're hopped up about, you know, two feet above the ground anyway. So, whew, not for me. Too much. Hello, everyone from Boston, Massachusetts. Epson P800. That's Henry Stoffel right there. Gary Jibalisco, Omaha, Nebraska. Is it cold out there, my friend? Yes, it is. I thought I saw something you posted in my uh, Facebook. Rod Levesque. Canada, happy Valentine P600, and a Pro 100. All right. All right, Wendy, I saw this earlier, but I couldn't interrupt Mike. I heard you say that printing borderless needs some physical items, correct? Does that mean extra borderless size cannot change from other models by firmware updates because need of this physical thing? No, the physical thing is the little sponges that are spaced on the metallic shiny that shiny strip that runs on the base of the printer when you open up the lid and you look inside there is a shiny strip of metal with little rollers little star wheels that has sponges on it little foam rubber absorbent sponges 
And if they don't have sponges located at specific widths, then a specific size cannot be printing borderless because that's where it's going to deposit the overspray that you create because you have to be able to print besides or outside the edge of the paper. Images will become enlarged somewhat. You're going to lose about 5 to 10% of your image because it has to enlarge it to make sure that you don't end up with a little sliver, a little very thin white border. That can occur because paper position is really not a perfect uh, art for printers, okay? As careful as you might be, it might be off slightly right or left. And so if you have a very perfectly matched, you know, 12 by 12 on a 12 by 12, you may have a border. You got to have a 12 on a quarter by 12 on a quarter on a 12 by 12. That way you have excess image beyond. And that extra ink that sprayed has to be caught by those little physical sponges that live on the platen. So if they don't put them there, then specific sizes cannot be printed borderless. All right, S. Matthews from Gainesville, Georgia. All right, nice to have you. Henry says, time to update QMH Ultimate to 21.3. Oh, did it come out? I only have 101, so I better update it. And we're going to have um, Mike uh, Cheney from Q Image Ultimate again, possibly in a couple of weeks. I think we'll have my friend from uh, Maryland here next week if he responds to me. And uh, he's going to give away Q Image Ultimate. Okay. That should be fun. Don't forget to use my affiliate link at the top of the chat. Hago Peg or Peg, uh, Hago Peg 2000, Toronto Pro 10, Pro 100 with PCSE. So he's up there where uh, the Great White North, where Mike lives. Alex Alca Alcantar, uh, Alcantar. So Pro 10 user, just figure out wireless printing. Anybody else having problems, I can provide a solution. Awesome. Most people that have problems is due to bad Wi-Fi, okay? They may have like um, a partial print and then the rest is blank. VC today says, thanks, Mike, for the review of the Pro 200. Love your ink and service. All right. Pixel Trainer says, hey, everybody, don't forget to give this stream a thumbs up. Yes. Let's make sure we do not leave before we do that. Alex says, thanks, Mike. I bought a refill kit and chip resetter. Worked great. Now, Mike was having a problem. I think I mentioned this maybe last week or the previous week. He couldn't find caps. And the reason is because of this whole COVID situation. Factories are have been shifted to produce other items. He finally found a source for caps. So there will be no shortage of caps. There will be no pause for orders, okay, because he literally didn't have bottle caps. I'm talking about this little doohickeys right here. He didn't have any more. Crazy. So now he found the source, and they are on the way. Sounds like better to waste the ink and replace all when low than to do one at a time times eight, of course. And... I don't want to brag, but I came up with that, uh, that situation. I've been doing this for a bit, okay? And printers that have internal waste ink pads, this has nothing to do with a printhead drying up and then, you know, that kills the printhead. Or if you print every day and you maintain your printhead in good condition, it'll last a long time. No, nothing to do with that. That's what, what the argument, you know, started. It has to do with waste ink pads. And this does not apply to, you know, industrial inkjet printers, like she was telling me. Okay? Nothing to do with that. It's a little printer like this. Okay? If I exchange only one cartridge at a time, when this printer was running without chipless, okay, I generate a cleaning cycle or purge cycle for the other five colors. They don't need to be purged. Why are they being purged? Because it does, period. So all that ink gets dumped into my little 
waste ink receptacle that lives right here. Okay. Lucky for me, I can replace that for $10. But on a printer like the Pro 100, Pro 10, Pro 1, those pads live inside the printer. They're just diapers. Okay. And the ink collects there. The more ink I generate, the quicker that septic tank gets full, if you get what I mean. Once it reaches full, screeching halt. It stops working. You got to send it in for replacement of those pads. Okay. We are lucky. How? Yeah, we are lucky. Remember, Mike just told you that the Pro 200 uses the same printhead as the Pro 1000, the Pro 100, sorry. That means that if that goes, you can get a printhead still, even though the Pro 100 is no longer under production. What about internal waste ink pads? I guarantee you it uses the same pads. Okay, so that's something that could be address you can send it in for repair it'll run you like 150 75 dollars something like that 150 or 175 dollars they will replace the pads and they will then reset the counter i can't do that myself they have to do it because they have to connect with special software to a secret service um, um server okay in order to be able to reset those pads. Replace and refill. Now, if you're really quick, now the Pro, uh, not Pro, XP15000, I can take all six cartridges, flip them upside down, and fill them visually. I can see when the sponge begins to get saturated. That means it's full. Or I can take my time and do them on a scale. I can still do all six of them, put, pop them back in, no problem. I don't have to have two sets, okay? I can have just a single set that's more than enough. But when you're dealing with 10 and 12 cartridges, then yeah, you have to have two sets. So you can quickly see what happened to Mike, that printhead started to move again, okay? Because it waited too long. He was chatting with us too much. so. You know, and weighing the cartridges and all of that, that took too long, okay? You have a certain amount of time to perform your refilling before that printer begins to move. Gregor Gregory says to Alex, uh, my Pro 10 only prints wireless from maintenance for some reason and no other program do you have. Do you know any solutions to this? Samuel C. Reyes Jr., is typically printing a three size or smaller. Would it be better to purchase the Epson P900 or the P700 due to the size of the ink cartridges volume? Okay, here's here's the big negative about those printers. There's some positive and I think some relative negative points. The positives are you got 10 colors, 10 channel pr printed, no more black ink switch valve. That's wonderful. But for God's sakes, why can't you have a big cartridge like the P800 does? 80 milliliters. They come with a 50 milliliter cartridge and a 25 milliliter cartridge. Heck, it even has less ink on those setup cartridges than the ones you buy later. So during the setup, you blow most of your ink. You literally have to have almost literally have to have a second set of inks waiting in the aisles from the get go okay positive on the p900 roll adapter yeah you can print on roll you can actually if you do mass production you can just print on a roll continuously and just trim them off output fantastic okay from what i hear i haven't had one yet that i can visually examine but you know waiting i'm still waiting for people to send me a cartridge so i can test these resetters that i have okay i want to see if this works the company's waiting for me to report but no one has come across and told me that they have a cartridge for me to test i need a p900 cartridge that is nearly empty or empty and i need a p700 cartridge again in the same condition 
it will be kind of use, useless to you anyway. You're going to toss it out anyway. So send it to me. I will come up with a method to refill them. I will reset it. And if indeed works, when you receive it, you pop it back in. And if it reads full, then we know we got something. I don't have a lot of faith at this point, but why not test it, right? So all I, all I want is someone who has their hands on one of these two printers to send me a nearly empty or empty cartridge. And you can contact me via email. Alex says, uh, Gregory, yes, download the Canon I, IJ network utility. Okay. Mexican Textile, Santa Rosa, California. Printer pending. Okay. Hopefully it'll arrive soon. Nathaniel Booth is here. He is from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm always blessed with by the knowledge from you and Mike. Uh, thanks and thanks again. We had a really nice live conversation. He has a PA-100 that he's going to go chipless with. But he found out, surprisingly, that he is going to get one run through his refillable cartridges. Okay. Apparently, his firmware is old enough that it's not blocking that. And that is one of the tricks that Epson is pulling on us. Alex Valcantar. Alcantar, Alex V. Alcantar, remove the printers from the Windows 10 and reinstall the driver. Okay, he's giving someone instructions here. We got Gary Neck from Waterboro, Maine, using Canon Pro 100, refilling with PC colors. Harold Goldberg, thanks, Mike, for your great presentation. Hey, always. It's a little awkward, but, you know, again, you're doing something live and uh, trying to get everything to uh, go smoothly. It's a little bit difficult unless you're production studio we are not okay if the pro 10 is going to be a bit always from your wireless okay yeah i actually i have used a wi-fi extender it's working very nicely okay dirk color from belgium using canon pro 2100 that is one hell of a printer my friend Wonderful. I'm glad you're using it, and I hope you are enjoying the living daylights out of it. I wish I had one. I just don't have the room for it. I wasn't lately in the, this is Jerry, wasn't lately on photo printing live stream. Does Mike, Precision Colors partner in Europe? No. Closer to, you know, yeah. Uh, right now, he doesn't really want to deal with that, okay, at this point, unfortunately. He's got too much on his plate. Jason Hancock's. Vancouver, Canada, Pro 100 just got snow a couple of days ago. We've been getting, I tell you, it's like every other day. My last drone video showed the beautiful snow that we got. Um, that was really neat, really neat. And the dog loved it. Visi today says, Winnipeg, Canada, Pro 100, 10 straight days with high of minus 20 and low of minus 40. Okay, forget it. No, I am not coming to visit you. No offense intended. I am staying here in warm 28 degree Maryland. S. Matthews, Sue Matthews, Gainsburg, Gainesville, Georgia, XP 15,000. Okay, are you willing to go chipless sometime in the future? I'll set you up. I'll help you out with that. Rainman 60515 from Chicago, Illinois, still a proud owner of an unopened Pro 100. I'm prepping CLI 42 OEM cards to use with PC, having a hard time with the cyan to be pristine white. Don't worry about it. Do not worry. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Just um, one run, whatever happens, you'll get most of the color out. It's very, it's what? What would, you, what would you call that color? These new colors that they're using. They stick, okay? They last forever. So they are going to be very um, difficult to clean unless it's Rick Johnson who has the uh, system down pat. He's able to bring them to a pristine look because he's actually adding extra ammonia to the uh, Windex. But anyway, don't worry about a slight cyan tint. It's not going to react at all. 
Janice Tuligan. Tuligan from Los Angeles. Oh man, my old, that's where I grew up. Southern California, new to the group, just got the Canon Pro 300. Awesome. Very good. I used to live uh, just down the hill from Dodger Stadium. I went to John Marshall High School near Las Feliz and, of course, near Hollywood. So spent uh, all my childhood there, besides the other half of my childhood in Puerto Rico. Jason Hancock's uh, visit today. I'm from Winnipeg, moved to Vancouver. I assume that's what that means, 2006. All right. Let's see, make sure that we get everybody here. Big game, James. We've got about another 20 minutes to go. Jose, can you recommend any pens to touch up minor flaws like white spots? You need retouching pens, okay? They are sort of like a watercolor type ink, if you want to call it ink, okay? And I think you, if you look up in um, any kind of photographic uh, sales sites, just search for you know, retouching pens. That's what we used to use in real photographs, by the way. Actually, we also use brushes and, again, like a little palette of watercolor, little, you know, like those little watercolor kits that you buy at the art shop, except they were made for, for retouching uh, prints. Okay, Nico says, Jose, can you make a video to show us how to make posters, big images, Big image on multiple pages on QImage. I think that's something that Mike better uh, approach because I know he mentioned it last week. We were talking about that. I have never really attempted to do that. Roberto Lorman says, Hi, Jose, tried to read the name of the city I am living now in Brazil. No, no. Guaratingueta. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, printing on the Pro 1000 OEM ink and having problems running kind of media configuration tool on a Mac. It can be a pain, okay? It can be a pain. I had to go back. In fact, lucky for you, the only videos that are available on YouTube about that tool are on Mac systems. So just search and see what you can find. I really haven't had a very easy time with it. And when you install the actual final results they have to kind of be double installed on the pro 1000 and they will come across on a new folder in your drop down menu called uh, custom i believe and now with the um i think the newer upgrade on the pro 1000 you can upload a lot more it used to be limited to only like five or six custom configurations which is ridiculous jamie says I is there a can an Epson EcoTank printer worth considering? Will Epson printers move toward more EcoTank printers? Can EcoTank printers use third-party inks? Yes. Um, no. And yes. As far as for photos, not so good. Okay. This comes from Mike. Okay. Not so good. They are great for your, you know, tons of documents and making handouts for your meetings in the office that are going to get thrown away anyway. That's it. There are some third-party inks that you can buy, of course, um, but that's about it. They're just met. They charge you a lot for the printer. It's the opposite approach where they charge you very little for the printer and charge you, you know, up the you-know-what for the ink. It's the opposite. You pay a lot for the printer, $500 even from the start, and then your inks are cheap. And the inks are really cheap. I mean, they're actually cheap inks, okay? They're not great. So you might as well just completely start using third-party inks. How can I reset my Canon ink cartridges after I refill them? MC, well, you need a resetter, okay? And there are resetters specifically for each type of printer. And um, for example, CLI 42, there's a resetter for that. CLI 72 for Canon Pro 10, there's a resetter for that. You basically attach the cartridge to the resetter. It will light up red, and it will eventually either go out or turn green or whatever. It depends on the resetter. There are many resetters for a lot of different printers. But 
For the Pro 10, we have a resetter. For the Pro 300, we do not. For the Pro 100, we have a resetter. For the Pro 200, we do not, okay? For the nine, uh, the P900, P700, we have resetters here. Will they work? Who knows? Okay, I have to get some cartridges from one of you folks to be able to test that process. But basically, you're going to mate the tank so that the chip mates with the components of the resetter, little tiny pins. They connect, they send code to the chip and rewrite that ink level to full. I think you had the same question twice. Calligraphy Johnson, I sold chips. I sold chips to a 3880 user and he's saying printer not registering, detecting the refillables. I have many ideas from you already, yet do you, Toolman, can give him any more now? Um, chips, often what happens, let me explain. The refillable cartridges, look like this, okay? You see this big old controller chip on top? That's what actually resets, okay? But it needs to know something about what color is this cartridge going to be, okay? So you have to put your original chip underneath it. Original OEM, if this is going to be a, a magenta cartridge, then you need a magenta OEM ink underneath that controller chip that I just showed you, this puppy right here, okay? If that original chip was allowed to go empty, it's not going to be recognized, okay? It has to be at least 15% above empty. That's that's the catch, okay? And can I provide chips? I, I cannot. I, I don't have enough for me to uh, give away or share or sell, okay? I only have what I have. So I just make sure that I never let them go empty. Okay, I think you're asking that numerous times. I know you were anxious probably when we were talking with Mike, but I think I explained how that goes. Let me get a resetter. Let me get a resetter for you to see. All right, so Mike was talking about the re the Red Setter Company. They're based in Germany. They create resetters that look like this, and they are not battery-powered. They are actually USB-powered. So let me plug this in. I hope I can see what I'm doing. Okay. This resetter is custom-made for the... Pro 10 cartridges. Here's a Pro 10 cartridge. So we're going, this is full. It's full of Chrome optimizer. So I have to, I have to kind of do it upside down. Okay. Because I don't want ink to come out of that port. So I'm going to orient the cartridge. Normally I would do it right side up, but we have to do it upside down so that I don't lose my Chrome optimizer. I want you to take a quick look. You see that little flash? See that red light? It's now gone. It's done. It's reset. Okay, now you have to make sure that your cartridge is full. Otherwise, the level that's going to be reported will not match the actual level of your cartridge. And that's critical. People ask me all the time, do I have to, do I have to reset when I refill? Of course you do. When you go get gas for your tank, petrol, uh, and your gas gauge is not reporting accurately your actual gas content. Does that make sense? Can you rely, can you go on a long trip and rely on that gas gauge to actually report how much fuel you have in your tank? It has to be reset. That means the gas gauge will be reset to full when you fill it up. If it did not, how good would that be, right? So yeah, it's you have to do both. 
If you choose to reset, you have to refill. If you choose to refill, you have to reset. I would do the resetting first because that means there's very little ink left in the cartridge. You will not have a mess when you actually reset the correct way, which is right side up. Calligraphy Johnson sent us $2.62 Super Chat. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate that. Every penny counts. There is a little dollar sign at the bottom that you guys can use if you want to donate anything to the channel. These, these types of live streams do not really generate much as far as uh, monetary, um, basically, profit, if you want to call it that. So we always rely on Super Chats from the viewers. If you got anything out of this live stream and you wish to contribute, you can do that freely by using the Super Chat. Gregory says to Alex that he's on Windows 7. I think we're still talking about a uh, connection problem. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I think we got to you. Yeah, he's anxious. Remember, we were talking to someone, okay? And I just demonstrated how to do it. We have to have patience. When I do the uh, live streams by myself, then I address everybody uh, on time. As soon as the question pops up, I usually address it. But when we have a guest, I have to kind of let things go, okay? So keep that in mind. Alex says, Gregory should be the same remove printer. Okay, we're talking about the problem. Janice, I don't know what you were uh, replying to, but okay, so. All right, MC, I hope you didn't leave um, mad. Um, like I explained, I hope you got to see how it's done. So, um, Again, remember that it's a specific resetter. Resetters are not universal. They will not work for like every kind of chip made out there. It has to be a specific type of cartridge to a specific resetter. Okay, Ron News Newsham. Newsham. You can say that different way, Newsham or Newsham. Um, my Epson 2880 is printing quite nicely, but paper feed is a bit hit and miss. Yeah. Um, that happens. The 2400 was very prone to transport problems. If I remember correctly, it used to give me a lot of problems. I sold it. I have bought some roller cleaner, so will be a job for the not too distant future. One quick little, quick little uh, thing you could do is basically take some regular bond paper like this, fold it in half, okay, like that. Okay. If you have a little spray bottle with some uh, the nature alcohol, maybe 70% rubbing alcohol, wet the upper half, then put it in your paper feeder and press the transport button. It will pull the paper through. The alcohol will clean any kind of uh, like lint and dust off of the rollers. They get dusty, they lose their grip. Okay. They cannot grip the paper or transport it. And then the other half will remove the moisture. And you do that several times. That has proven to me to be a good fix. Now, you got to be careful with alcohol okay, and rubber components because it will dry them out. There are some specific fluids. Like you said, you just got some that can be used a lot more efficiently. Ron says, I would put, I will, I will be putting some refillable cards in it next time I change the ink. All right. Milan Rejek says, greetings, everybody. Jose, you look great after all that torture. Yeah. Uh, I was actually bruised up right here pretty badly. Uh, I thought the dentist was wrestling with me. And I almost, why didn't you just put me to sleep, you know, during this? And it was very difficult to do. And I still got some treatment to go. I got my full, like everything here is full, no problem at all. I just had that bone problem. So like I said, it's gonna it's gonna require bone grafting. And I didn't have any clue. Um, my parents apparently suffer from that and 
as far as I remember when I was young, they were all wearing dentures prematurely, okay? And so that's something that I am grateful that I haven't reached that point yet, okay? So I'm not there yet. We're, we are we are taking care of it now, uh, preventing any kind of future damage from occurring. All right. Cannot take part today, but please stay. Everyone be healthy. Keep printing and keep distancing. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Nick Hallstrom. I have eight empty CLI 42 cards. If anyone's interested in purchasing, please make me an offer. Well, a couple of bucks per cartridge is about the going rate uh, on eBay at this point. So if anyone uh, wants to make an offer, go ahead and do so right here. And you can actually, I don't think you can share email addresses. I don't believe you can do that. So I don't know how they would contact you. Okay. Um, let me see. There's no way that I can actually even access your information. All right. So calligraphy, calligraphy Johnson, I am asking for any other reasons. Refillable T58 cartridges won't register. Oh, 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 okay. Again, if they're under 15, that's it. Under 15%, that's it. They will not be seen anyway. If you reset them, okay. And I got my resetters are in the next room, so I don't have them here with me. But if you try to modify one of these and you're successful and you want to reset the chip, you have to do it before it reaches that low point. Okay. And you got to be really systematic with it. Um, I used to get a ton of these cartridges from a, a school and uh, often they would not reset properly. So, and from what I understand now, the light magenta and the light magenta, light black and light, light black no longer reset. I guess it has to do with the the age of the cartridge um, manufacturing, okay? The date, I should say. I think they did something to a specific set of chips. And the current resetters that were available no longer work. Luckily, the ones that I am using on my two machines are of a specific date where I can still manage to reset them, okay? But at some point, I think ultimately I will probably be getting rid of those, the 3880 and the 3800 because I really don't have any use for them anymore. So, all right. As sad as that would be, yeah, I would find a good home for them. Maybe one of the local schools. Jerry says, great live stream. Once again, Jose, go to, go to get dinner time. Yes, pretty soon I will. Got about another uh almost there we're almost there alex wow thank you man 499 super chat and hank junkman five dollar super chat thank you so much yeah that that will help that helps to buy supplies and things like that that's how we survive here all right so neil let's see neil holstern no worries thank you what were we talking about? Yeah. The yeah, the that was something to do with uh yeah. Um if you're a member of my Facebook group, you can freely post that there. Okay. Post that offer there. And uh people will jump at the at the chance, I'm sure. Again, like I said, I think they're selling for like I don't know, thirty dollars per set, you know. Thanks, Jose, for time for dinner. Super helpful information, as always. Thank you so much, man. My Epson 1430 Miss Fee's paper very often pulls it in an angle. Yeah, very frustrating. There is no rear end, no rear feed option. Is the round rubber wheel prone to wearing out? Yes, it is. It loses tack, absolutely. That, on, on, on Epson printers that basically grab the paper on the right side. In other words, you move the paper and align it to the right edge. There is a there is a grabber that grabs that paper initially. 
and that can lose. If you if it grabs it wrong, it will shift the angle. Okay. Um, printers like the okay, I don't want to push you to buy a new printer, but the Pro 100 didn't have this. The Pro 10 did not have that. The Pro 200 and the 300 have anti-skew technology. If it, for whatever the reason, misfeeds the paper, it will automatically adjust it for you because what it's doing it is reading the sides. And if it sees that the side edge is changing position as it travels, it'll do that prior to printing. It will actually do a test. It will advance the paper. It will check the edges and then reverse it back and adjust one of the rollers to actually turn faster than the other, and it will readjust that feed angle, okay? You will not have any kind of uh, skewing. That's available in this new printer. But the older ones, the 1400, 1430, yeah, they do suffer from that. They do. So I still have one. I still have one that I use occasionally. Nat, you did. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Nat. You did not have to do that, my friend. But I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. Let me know. Let me know soon how you're doing on that uh, P800 with those refillable cartridges. Appreciate that, you guys. Randall Dodds. Hey, yes, Jose. Today's live stream was very informative. Thank you. I'm glad it was, man. I, I This afternoon, I had a talk at noon. So we spoke with a gentleman that was here with us, Pro 1000 owner. And uh, was about an hour and a few seconds past that. We stayed on a little bit longer. I was losing my voice at that point. So I didn't know where I was going to last tonight. But anyway, I'm glad that we did. Roberto says goodbye to all friends. And Jose, thanks again for great support. All right. So I have on my phone some subjects that I'm going to be covering in videos. And again, it depends. The... Monday's a holiday, so I'll be home. We're going to be doing a little bit of shopping. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, basically um, be home. And hopefully I'll get something done video-wise. I won't be doing any flying, of course, because the weather is dismal. So I will be doing something to do with a new subject. So I, I, I think I need to show you guys um, some of the tricks that you can do, especially you guys that are refilling Pro 100 cartridges, and you haven't bought the set from Rick Johnson, which I did not see here tonight with us. Too bad he didn't come in because he's usually here with us. He's a guy on eBay that produces the best fully, fully clean, spanky clean, snow white sets of CLI 42 cartridges, okay, for you to then refill. They come preloaded with the plugs, the special um, clips at the bottom, that are the best in the market, and he charges $60 per set. They're original cartridges, not, not CLIs converted. No, the original ones. So I'm going to show you what to do if you choose to do this yourself. Okay, If you choose to do this yourself, I'm going to show you what to do to solve, or at least get you going if you make any mistakes during the drilling process. I'll show you one quick fix that you can apply. And so that'll be one of the videos. And I think, what, what was I going to be discussing? There's a lot of other things that I wanted to talk about. We just run out of time. That's what happens. So anyway, it's coming. Just hang in there, folks. Keep going to the Facebook group. By the way, I just uploaded, thanks to a viewer, the service manual for the Pro 100. It's available on my files tab. Okay. That's rare, folks. So make sure you grab that. If you're a Pro 100 owner and you want to know not just the instruction book, but how to disassemble that baby, okay, and get into internal components, fix, do this, do that, the service manual will help you to do that, okay, achieve that. All right. I think that's about it. No, wait a minute, Roberto, what is this? I hope that wasn't like a total huge amount of money, man. Come on. You're, you're awesome. All right. Thank you. Love you, man. Wendy, take care and wish you a quick recovery. Best. Love you. Okay. You do the same and stay safe up there in beautiful 
Belgium. Gosh, I wish I was there again. Randall Dodd says the printheads on the 200 can be used on the 100 when we need them. Wow, yes. And that is mega, okay? And I think maybe the same thing with the 300, okay? The 300 and the 10, because remember, there are no more tens available. There aren't any. It's done, okay? It's done. The P600, the same way from Epson. Those are gone. It's all about the P700 and the P900. Well, with Canon, you can run across a Pro 10. You can run across a Pro 100. They're asking exorbitant prices for these printers now. That's what happens when the demand is high and the volume or available volume is very low. That's what happens. So like Mike said, and again, you can take this with a grain of salt. If you already have a Pro 100 and it's working properly, and I'm using his inks, which took care of that red problem, remember? Okay. This was one of the big fixes that Canon did on the Pro 200 ink set. Okay. They solved that red problem. The ability to produce a really true red, not an orangey red. So don't even consider getting a you know, 200, unless you need that 12 by 12 borderless or 5 by 5 borderless or 8 by 8 borderless. That's the only reason I would I would get one. Wonderful printer. If I didn't have a printer and I'm not worried about refilling, oh, heck yeah. You bet. You bet. It's got some fabulous features. It's a great printer. It's built really well. Yeah, you are not going to see it on rebase like you did the Pro 100, but, you know, that's that's in the past okay we need to deal with the future now so that's 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 it as far as i am concerned that would be a good printer if you want pigment ink prints in other words why would you choose one over the other because you're printing on glossy paper glossy paper where's my glossy print? Glossy print. I always show that upside down. Glossy, glossy print, and you don't want any gloss differential. Okay? Which pigment might show, unless you have a printer with chroma optimizer. Okay, that, that diminishes that. But again, if you're just going to print on, on shiny papers, then get a Pro 200. If you can find a Pro 100, get that as well. If you're going to print on fine art papers that require more longevity... Okay, pigment than the Pro 300 or the Pro 1000 or the P900 or the P700. Okay, those are all really good printers. They all use high-end ink palettes that are made with extremely long-lasting pigment inks, okay, or pigment um, raw materials, let's just say. They will last longer than you will ever wish to have them, believe me, you'll get tired of these prints. <laughs> They'll be staring at you till the day you die and your kids and their kids. So anyway, that I think is about it. Let me see what else we got here. Charles, good evening to all, take care. Rick Johnson, you were here, you sneak, you were watching us. I gave you another best show on earth. Oh, come on, man. I think it was good, I think it was good. So I think that's gonna be it. I'm going to do what I normally do. I'm going to post this right here. I'm going to start our music. And please say goodbyes. Happy Thanksgiving. See you next time. Toodaloo, whatever you want to put. And I will post as many as we get. When we run out, I'll go ahead and terminate the stream. So from now on, we'll be seeing you until next week. I salute everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much again for all the support. Okay, I'm going to have to address this. Okay, with the refillable cartridges that you currently have, okay, you will get one, one run. 
Okay. Before any of those cartridges reaches almost empty, that's when you need to install your chipless solution. Okay. That, or ink chip, whatever you chose to purchase. Okay. And then we will get back on and I will walk you through the process. You cannot reset those cartridges at all. Okay. They will give you one run. Epson. Thank Epson for that. When we go chipless, then all you do is top them off as you need to. Whenever you want to top them off, top them off. Okay. So that's that's all you got. We'll deal with that when the time comes. Just make sure you let me know when you're getting low on one of those cartridges. And it would make um, absolutely total sense to just top them off to full. So that when you go chipless, they're all full anyway. All right. Thank you again. We'll talk again very soon. Not to worry. Don't be shy, folks. Say goodnight. I got a little bit more music to play. <laughs> <laughs>